And time to do one final watch report of the season. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode. It's been one of those days, Saturday. I've, uh, <laughs> I, it's, always, it's always a challenge. Once it hits the 10 o'clock hour, you just realize that you're a little bit behind schedule. And I've been having to catch up quite a bit. So I'll get into the watches in a second. Just want to say hi to you and then we can get into the, the discussion, which should be pretty good. I see. Welcome, Paris. Uh, Sparkles, Turbo, Reserve Commander, jean claude Beaver, Marco, welcome. Ox, uh, ACR Speed, Brian, Thomas, Scott, and Philip. Welcome to all of you who are joining in. I wanted the show to be a bit quiet. I haven't been promoting it on the community page or anything like that. I've wanted to keep it a bit more low-key today because... It's pretty much a recap of the year's watches that we've been looking at. So it's nothing crazy exciting. You know, overall, we're going to be running through the watches, the most, the watches that have impacted us the most this year, the favorite watches of 2021. And in it, we can share a few more bits and pieces that we've maybe been thinking about. On the left hand side of the screen, I've got the watches lined up. First thing, just want to do a shameless plug. I put this video out this week on a Seiko 5 that I really, really enjoyed. I'll link that in the corner after the show. This was a lot of fun to put together. And this arrived in the mailbox. The brew company sent in a, a series of coffees to test and taste. These have been letting me run over the last couple of weeks, got to say. Um, it's stunning. Basically what it is, for someone who's a novice to coffee, it's an advent calendar, something very important this time of the year. 24 plus 1 espressos or standard coffees they come in this this package it's brilliant and they're like mres meals ready to eat so you just pour the water in filter it through and you've got a little spout you can be your own your own brew maker which is really nice and you get to experience coffees from all over the world so tonight i'm having india which is pretty nice okay let's get into the watches and start the show before because i don't know how long this is going to be i'm very interested in knowing your thoughts around the pieces that have made the most impact this year because they've been quite a lot it's been quite extensive seeing the the releases surprisingly it's been a pretty good year for watch releases all around okay let me get into the chat one more time and then we can start with good old speedmaster i see ken joining us welcome from pittsburgh v marsh welcome scott again i think i said hi to you ken welcome again cowboy dylan and thomas I see you again thank you everyone for joining in this time of the year everyone is cooling down i don't think there's much going on really in the in the watch world uh most people are going away on holiday i would have loved to have done this next weekend but of course that's the 25th i think so it wouldn't work out very well yeah this is going to be a chilled show I don't know, but just there are going to be some interesting talking points here and there. It would be nice to hear your opinions around subjects and releases. Before getting into the Speedmaster, the first watch I want to address. This was on the cover photo, deliberately because it's a really pretty, should I say, really attractive looking image to get you hooked on the photo itself. Since I haven't addressed this watch in any talks, I thought it would be nice for us to weigh up opinions about how this piece has made quite the impact recently. And, you know, what, what's also really cool is that it epitomizes, it sums up the end of the year, the end of 2021 in many ways. I think that's what's quite nice. It's that cornerstone watch to end the, the season. What do you think about it? Because to me, I can understand why people would love it, but I also feel in a way it's, it's everything that epitomizes the good and the bad of where the watch space is at the moment. Should I say the, you know, the hype and the intrigue for pieces like these, hitting the water. Yeah, been one of those days. Might be a bit slow. I might be a bit slow to warming up, but hopefully the coffee will will kick in. Instablan, I think I said hi to you. Welcome. The new Speedy has really improved. Yes, definitely want to talk about that. There have been some some amazing releases, subtle releases, also lots of facelifts here and there. But I think on the whole, we have seen some surprising launches that have caught our attention, which I hope to share. <laughs> the, Tiff the Tiffany 5711. Let me try and get into it. I haven't looked at watches all day today, so I'm gonna like you know wake up to it by by talking about this, having a bit of a rant, I guess. There have been some very good discussions around this piece. I think the one element that we should all bring in is that Patek seems to flip flop between saying, "Okay, we're going to be we're going to be stopping this craze. Let's release the watch in green, cap off the 5711, and then they bring this out." co-branded 
Philips auction. It's like an all perfect storm for getting this watch to sell. I see lots of mention about Jay Z getting one. Yeah, I mean, I think there's only like 170 of these in the world or something. But I mean, what six and a half million? It's oh, there we go. Six point five million. It sold for at, at Philips. And, and all the money went towards charity, which is a good thing. But still, it's like. What's the deal? I want to know, just as I get into the chat and say hi to you again, a few more of you, um, I want to do a yes and no about this watch. Hold on a sec. Let's see who I'm missing. Corvette man, welcome. Brandon, Seif, um, anybody have the off-brand Tiffany OP from Trasker? There's so many watches that have these Tiffany dials. It's crazy. Turbo mentioning Jay-Z's wrist here. I've been seeing that everywhere. And also, it's also such a great marketing campaign since he's an ambassador for the piece and everything. Uh, Design Atelier, welcome, sir. Good to have you here. Yeah, so like, this is what I want to know. Barring the collectability and the fact that this watch now sells for, I can't imagine how much these are listing for, probably like two and a half million on the gray market, something daft. I want to know, out of everyone here, just with a Y or an N, would you want to buy this watch and own this watch purely to wear the watch? No other reason. Like, you have to be someone who loves the Nautilus. You also have to love the Tiffany Blue. I'd be interested in knowing, I can see an N already from Turbo. It's, I'm interested in knowing your, your thoughts around it first off. It's it's one of those pieces that, uh, oh, I've got a couple of yeses. That's cool. Majority no, though, it looks like. Oh, there's another yes. <laughs> there's some people who think this is the best watch of the year. And I think it's good to address. I, I think regardless of your preferences, it's a watch worthy to be talked about because, of course, it's <laughs> the centerpiece that everyone seems to be discussing yes at retail price or lower yeah that's another thing getting it at retail next to getting it yeah prices that's a laugh welcome 73 math many more of you that i'm missing i see jenks and jasper and uh, it's great to have you all here thank you for joining in absolutely no it looks like there is a majority no so that's a good thing it's, i guess i mean odds are of us getting this watch extremely low um all things considered since there are only a handful but yeah, it's like the perfect storm to end off the year. They do this release and drives everyone crazy. I mean, the articles and the stories, the, the business insider. I mean, you're not getting, these aren't articles written by monochrome. You're getting business insider and CNBC, I think CNN, all of these pages are writing about this watch like it's a grail, the, the, the next coming, you know, but it's, it's a blue dial Nautilus. <laughs> and imaginative at best and has the rolex you know blue release that they did has that perpetuated the drive for this interest was this something in the pipeline all along it's an instagram watch i mean it is, it's the flexing machine yeah absolutely so we can get away from it um but i think you know if in in all things it's worthy to mention oh here we go here's a good reference since it's capping off the end of 2021 that's the kind of watch that everyone's been talking about and i think makes for a good centerpiece i also just love the blue for a cover photo i think it's very pretty but other than that on the wrist it looks extremely gaudy to say to say the least op at least is a lot more toned down i don't know i mean the one nautilus that i really loved was that white dial that they did very similar to this white dial that the numerals the batons were just the same um Neff, welcome, Neff. This watch is hideous. Let's move on. <laughs> we can do it. Truth is, welcome. And Roar of the Tiger, many more of you joining in. Thank you, everyone who is hopping into the show. It's been, it's been a while since we've done one of these. And it is essentially a recap of some of the best releases of the year. Some of our favorites, we should say. And yeah, there's about 30 of them that I've chosen. I'm sure we can shortlist it down to a few more. Since there were so many you know, bits and pieces of feedback about people's favorite watches, I have tried to find a watch that epitomizes the brand it represents in a way and then from there we can go and look into the brand's releases in more detail <laughs> i wonder if it was a freebie 73 math i believe he's an ambassador for patek so i'm pretty sure he did get it for free yeah i mean it's it's just perfect marketing and advertising that whole community you know the music industry they, they'll all go mad for them and that's how it goes let's get into something a bit more realistic down to earth the moon watch chatting about the 3861 this came out, I think, like the first week of January this year. I mean, how crazy is that? 2021 has been quick, but it's also been the first half, I think, was, was pretty long. The second half sped up faster and faster. And this, I think most of us would agree, is probably the best release from Amiga this year. Surprisingly, they did quite a bit. I mean, I wanted to shortlist the Aquaterra small seconds. I, I love that watch, but I know... <laughs> not anyone seems to love the watch, but I loved the facelifted Aquaterra. 
uh, the the Seamaster 300 I've also featured later on that we'll have a look at. But this, the 3861, Hesalite, Sapphire, great step forward. I guess the price is the only thing that's really contestable. We talk about how the price has gone up quite a bit for this piece. But, I mean, just such a great, great change in a few elements. Just making it feel a bit more substantial. The Jubilee bracelet, or whatever you would call it, the 80s-inspired bracelet is much more comfortable. Uh, just simple things, simple touches that brings this watch into a more modern space. And the rest of you that are missing, Jes uh, Jesper saying the bracelet was a fantastic update. Yeah, I've I've known that a lot of people who who have bought the 1861. They tend to take the bracelets off because the the thing that's always bugged me about them is the is the end link. That center link is just too too long. I don't know if the mouse is working for me. That center link there is just it protrudes too much over the wrist. If you already have a pretty average sized wrist. All of a sudden, having that center link extend to like, what, 50 millimeters can make the wearing experience a bit strange. Having a female center link, I think more watches should be doing it. We, we are seeing it, actually, through these pieces that we'll be looking at. Seems like the female center link is being adapted more just for the sake of ease of wearability. It's a bit more old school, too. Yeah, this, this was one of the best watches of the year. I mean, not just from Omega. This was a huge highlight. And I love the fact that it got so much publicity, pl publicity and, you know, it was shared everywhere. It's good. Legit wears better than the old version. Yeah, has a 38 millimeter. Yeah, they're also, also coaxials. So they did a lot of things. I mean, just the update to the caliber, I guess, in a way, it is, you know, removing the original you know, old school 1861. That'll always be a legendary movement in its own right. But going to the, the coaxial arrangement and the chronometer rating, being meta certified and all of that awesome stuff. I love it. I think it was such a great improvement. Chrono Craze, welcome. Quickly, I always consider the, the bright pastel color dial craze started after a microbrand, Helios, the Helios C4, right? Uh, they all seem to come after the Helios. Helios is hard to get and costs more secondhand. I love that watch. I was trying to remember the name of it the other day. <laughs> I couldn't, but I featured it on Wrist Shot Week. It's a fantastic little piece. I remember that pastel blue standing out and everyone going, wow, this is something else. And in a way... These colors have now trickled down to the big names and they're going mad for them. Yeah. The brands are slowly moving to more colorful watches. And I think that came from mods that were created by the SKX from Seiko. Jacobs, good point there. Yeah. I mean, the modding community is another world. We're going to have a look at a really cool micro brand that was suggested to me. Thank you, whoever you are in the chat who suggested it to me. It's a brand that I did not, um, it, I saw it. We'll get to it when we get to it. But bright and colorful, absolutely. Getting to a stage now, the monochromatic watch is good. Nice to have in a collection. But then at the same time, a spot of color is also pretty nice. Just adds that little bit of dynamism. Uh, yeah, you see, uh, Andrew says, tried the old Speedmaster on. And with the Centrelink, it wore bigger than the Black Badge. Yeah, that's it. That's it, Andrew. It's, it's a weird thing how just a simple Centrelink change can shift the entire arrangement. Of course, not everything about this watch is perfect. We saw that, what's it called? The... the the Speedmaster Chrono, Chrono Master, no, what is it called? I can't remember. The, the one with the, fun, the fancy dial, the tachymeter scale, they also introduced a new class with that model. This doesn't have the micro adjust feature, but I believe it's going to be integrated into the system soon. This pinhole arrangement has to go. It's just too old fashioned. They've got to shift to the, to the simple push adjust system. I love these photographs. This being the Sapphire model because of the applied, the applied logo. Chronoscope, that's the one. <laughs> I did a video about it. The, the Omega Chronoscope, yeah. I mean, they did that. They practically did that watch just to improve the, the clasp on it in many ways. Also to talk about the new caliber. They did a lot of stuff on a watchmaking front this year. Thank you, everyone. The Chronoscope, yeah, yeah. Okay, so the Speedmaster, I mean, does it even need any more accolades? It's, it's an ideal piece worth getting, worth every penny. I think they are stunning watches. As far as pieces that capture Omega as a brand, go for it. I am more of a Speedmaster lover every day of the week, but, sorry, let's say, I said Seamaster, I hope. Seamaster lover every day of the week, but the Speedy is a legend. It'll always have that title. <laughs> thanks, thanks, St. Peter. Yeah, that was that was good fun. I enjoyed that Chrono Master clip. That was just when I did the face reveal on the channel, which is amazing. <laughs> Julian, welcome. And the rest of you who haven't said hi to, um, let me just get to another piece. We've chatted about the Tiffany, <laughs> the Tiffany dial. Uh, we'll leave this here for a sec. I just want to say hi in the chat. Turbo again, Chronoscope, and you may have redesigned it much better. 
Yeah, it was just putting that that old school case on it. The so CK two two nine nine eight two nine two nine eight eight. One of those references. That case is a is a dream. It's really good. And yeah, let's move on to the next piece. What now? Oh, this thing. This thing. So when we talk about best watches of the year, we're also going to talk about more affordable pieces. We're not just going to go to the super high end stuff, but. This was also a watch that was introduced around January. Um, if I hit the play button, I think it's going to take me to Instagram and it'll be a disaster. But this Moser Endeavor Minute Repeater Tourbillon in titanium, electric blue dial. Now, before they brought this out in 2021, this, this electric blue, they brought it out in black, I believe. This has to, I, I would honestly say that this is probably my favorite Moser of all. If I had the choice of one Moser, I think I would go for this. I, it's actually, I would say, my, one of my top 10 favorite watches of the year. Top five, maybe. It's just too good. It's just way too good. Limited to 20 pieces. So, yeah, we're getting right into the rare and attractive stuff today. Um, <laughs> uh, let's see if I can catch up with you here. Sorry, that I'm missing you. It's going to be a slow, it's going to be a slow, like, first. We're doing pretty well, 15 minutes. It's going to be a slow first half an hour or so. The Hesselite on the new one scratches as well as the old one too. <laughs> it says, I tell you, acrylic crystals, no joke. Uh, when it comes to polishing them, literally your, your sleeve can scratch an acrylic crystal. It's a mind blow how easy. Even if it's brand new out of the box, you have to treat it with kit gloves because kit, kid gloves because, yeah, it scratches so fast. The beauty is that you can polish it up really easily too. Yeah, this, so Neff says not digging this Moser. I bet you if it wasn't green, you would dig it. I did a redesign of this somewhere. I think it might have been on the January live stream. Remember, this is a recap of, of the videos, of the streams that we've done over the course of this year, looking at all the different quarters. Uh, I find this to be so out there. I mean, Moser has never been conventional with their work. Uh, but I think what they have done with this crazy, crazy machine, I, f I find the details amazing. The the whole idea of making the core components exposed is something you don't see very often with watch design and, and pieces in general today. So that whole artisanal approach of exposing the, the chimes and exposing the, the rings that run around the dial, making that a feature, it's something that the designer will always appreciate. It's, it's something about reduction, but then also praising the things that help define the piece that's important in a design, especially if you want it to last the test of time. And the tourbillon's also great. It's, it's not the most legible watch in the world, but I mean, it's a minute repeater, so you don't need to worry about the you know, about telling the time in general. New Vacheron complete calendar. I did feature the the excellence. No, what was it? It's that long, long one. Uh, I forgot the name. I do have it saved in here somewhere. We'll get down to it eventually. Uh, I think I saved it. There were so many. As the show goes through, we can chat about them, pull them up again. When we get to Vacheron, I'm sure we can like hop between brands. The other Moser that I saved was the Dual Time, the, the Burgundy Dual Time, I think it was. Another great piece. Yeah, some excellent stuff. Some excellent, excellent stuff coming out this year. This one, this one was great. Anyway, Moser chatted about this piece enough. <laughs> That's a lot of question marks. <laughs> yeah, MB Global, thanks for that. Uh, yeah, the rest of you, again, I'll try my utmost to catch up with you. The Tissot PRX versus the Gentleman. I was going to mention the Tissot. I think I will pull up the Tissot PRX. One watch that did grab my attention is the Citizen 0200, which was an in-house caliber that they introduced. That should be coming up later. She also mentioned that the order of this selection of watches did not save very well today. So I'm going to be typing in a few bits and pieces. The reason why I'm talking about this watch next, Longines Big Eye, because I bought this watch this year. I bought the original. And... I'm working through editing a state of the collection video at the moment for next week. The reason why I'm mentioning this watch is because the Longines Big Eye has been the best purchase I've ever made, the best watch purchase I've ever made. That's how well it's integrated into my day to day. It's it's such a good watch. I don't know how much more time, how many more times I can praise it. What makes this one cool? The blue dial is is a bit cliche, I guess, a bit conventional, but the idea of having a pilot's watch in titanium is fantastic, um, and the idea that what happened when this watch was released, more attention went back to the big eye line. I like that because this piece came out in 2017, the original. So, you know, it, it died down quite a bit. There wasn't much talk going on around it. Suddenly you see this watch in blue, which created a bit of interest around it. Then in titanium, attention went back to it. And it seems like a lot more people are picking up the big eye. 
today, which is fantastic. Such a good watch. Longines as a brand, I cannot talk highly enough about. The build quality, they're just rock solid. You could take this thing anywhere and abuse it, and it would last. It's so, so good. Um, also, I think the whole automatic ETA-based caliber is, is fantastic. I mean, it's super wearable for its size. And just this, what just to, just to give you a bit of a, a recap, I have never been a chronograph person, ever. Like, chronographs and me have never gelled properly. But this one changed all of that. This pretty much made me reinterpret how I saw the chronograph. And that makes a big deal. Did those Zenith reissues come out this year? See if there were lots of Zenith reissues. A385, they did a model. But the one that I captured for this one is the Chronomaster original that we'll talk about. That was superb. Also underrated, not spoken about very much. Mm. Yeah, I love this watch. Do I need to, do I need to elaborate any more? Proportions, good balance titanium case would be awesome they need to do more of these watches maybe go back to the the black dial maybe gray dials or tropical dials you know titanium case for the lightweight feature the whole idea of aviation blending in there too mm. both are great but better than your omega 57 we're talking about which one are you talking about chrono craze the, the the big eye yeah they're, they're two different categories that's how i've rational again in the in the state of the collection video i try to rationalize it by saying that the seamaster is is a part of me you know it's it's an heirloom this is just a great watch it's just something it's it's always the one that i will grab and go with you know it's not a piece that i have to think about and go eh, is this the one for today anyway beautiful dial i mean texture everything there so the main reason why i'm highlighting this watch is it's great that it got attention on it again but the main, main reason is that for 2021, the big eye shifted my entire perspective around chronographs, and that was good. The Spirit Chronograph, they did some good stuff. I think while we're on it, I think I should just type in Longines 2021 and have a look at a few things that they had shared. This is what I wanted to do to save us time. Instead of dancing around one watch, we jump to what they have released over the course of the year. I mean, the Silver Arrow, they brought this out quite recently, I think. And I love the fact that they're looking into their classic repertoire of pieces. They're not necessarily focusing on the modern stuff, though some of these pieces are great. The, the Hydra Conquest they do. Um, they brought out a series of, I don't know why there aren't other results. Hold on a sec. These, these Heritage Divers are also fantastic. They brought it out in tropical and in blue. Mm, nice, really nice. I like that they are so diverse and they have such a broad portfolio to, to pull from. Yeah, let's have a look at the spirit if I can find it. Um, I found them interesting. The only thing that bugs me about these, uh, what's this, the whole 2021 release list? Let's see. The Chrono was beautiful. This is the model here, right? That is great. That is so, so great. Yeah, I mean, it's it's all down to personal preference once again. It's it's how do you want to interpret the piece? This one, the the one on the on the right, which is the the spirit chrono, I believe. If I can find another a better shot of it somewhere. Hmm, let's see. Bear with me, ladies and gents. The standard spirit's great. They've also brought out the Heritage Classic in, in black, which was really nice. On a beads of Bryce, beads of beads of Bryce bracelet, which was also a goodie. Where did that model go? Hold on. I'm gonna pull up the spirit chrono and we can actually compare them side by side somehow. <laughs> Just be warned, I'm a bit slow today. Today's been a slow day. I really just enjoy the standard time only. That is a goodie. How many great watches did they bring out? It's everything from the handset to the applied numerals to the minute track that runs around it. Everything seems just well balanced and proportioned. Very 1940s. Uh, not much of a titanium fan, horology lawyer. I can understand that. Uh, the, the color itself can be a bit flat. I mean, here are these models in titanium. You can see the gray. The, the gray finish is a little bit more dark than you would expect from, from stainless standing out. Mm. Anyone put a mesh on the big eye? Go on to Instagram and have a look what those guys do. It's crazy. The, the selection of, of combinations that they do. That's the one downside of the big eye is that it always asks for straps. So just quickly before moving to the next series of pieces, uh, will this load up? Maybe not. Hmm. Blog to watch. I'll have to go into blog to watch to have a look at these, won't I? Hold on a second. Is that any good? Please. Bueller. <laughs> you get you get the gist of it, but uh Hodinky, will you load? Yes, Hodinky, you will load for me. Big difference between these two watches. You can see that quite easily. 
the divide. There is more sim symmetry. Of course, the, the one thing with the, the big eye is the, is the offset subdials. Everything's centralized here. Everything is applied. The date window, love it or hate it, between the four and the five can be a bit of a hit or miss. But you know, as a daily going watch, not the worst thing in the world. I just wish it had more stars. Yeah, that's that's the thing that bugs me about it. I don't understand. I, I guess it's their, their assertion for quality and it's what they've always used for the Spirit series. But it can be a little bit, you know, ostentatious when you've got all that arranged on your watch. They were the white dials. I mean, you just fall down rabbit holes upon rabbit holes when you talk about these things. Longjin did a lot of releases 2021 worth looking at. Uh, the big eye I highlighted because it was early in the year and I think just great fun. Hitting the coffee one more time. Oh, sorry that there's so many comments going on. Sorry that I'm missing you. I will be there in a moment. Um, <clears throat> so Sif says the big eye looks way more like a tool. The others are more dressy. Yeah, I mean, utilitarian. <clears throat> it's all down to personal preference again at the end of the day. And please tag me in the chat if you want to get my attention. Sorry that I'm missing you. It's going to be a slow, slow one. Um, no date spirit titanium is superb. Roger Lawyer. I think I've read that already about titanium. Dolce Vita. Okay, we're going to carry on to the next pieces because it's going to take all freaking week to go through. Grand Seiko next. Now the white birch. <clears throat> Correct me if I'm wrong. <clears throat> Correct me if I'm wrong, but I think this was released. It was released this year. This has been one of the biggest talking points around the Seiko brand. And to do in a in a way with how you know it's helped redefine the, the direction of the snowflake line. Everyone was crazy for the snowflake when it came out. And this was the next, the next step. And yeah, the texture on the dial is awesome. I think we've we've chatted about this watch enough. Some great reviews about this piece been going around. It's amazing what Grand Seiko can do when it comes to finishing their dials. <clears throat> I'm just gonna cough quickly. Hold on a sec. Muting the mic, beautiful. Uh, this was a GPHG winner, St. Peter. That's great to know. Okay, I did not know that. I did follow GPHG to a point, but then I, I lost. I lost all the awards. But I mean, yeah, I think it's worthy of it. It's defined. It's defined the Grand Seiko direction. It's great. Um, we can talk a bit more about Seiko later on. I don't know. I don't think I featured any of the standard Seikos. Just two Grand Seikos. But this one definitely has guided more attention to the Grand Seiko name, especially after this release, which I think is pretty good. And I mean, they're terrific watches. I love talking about these different categories. The fact that we're not always sticking to Swiss. It's good to see some Japanese watchmaking in there too. I just imagine the loudest cough. Yeah, it's, it's a beautiful thing having a mute button, um, just being able to switch it off completely. <laughs> cough my lungs out and then come back. Uh, yeah, it's good. The hour hand bothers me a bit. Reserve commander. We talk, ooh, ooh, we're talking about this sucker here on the left. It's quite thick. It is quite thick. And of course, it's done. It's interesting how there, there's like a, a dichotomy where when you're looking at something like a dress watch, you want to focus on the hours and not so much the minutes, where when you're dealing with a dive watch, you want to focus on the minute hand. So very often the minute hand is bolder or, or it's a different color, like an orange, or it has a big arrow on it or something. Yeah, I get you there. I get you. Also, just dig things. Why brands? Why not all brands? Why don't they frame their date windows? I think it just adds that touch of, you know, we give a damn about the date. This is not an afterthought. This is a part of its package. And it just ties in so much nicer with the batons on all the sides. And yeah, I mean, simple stuff. Very, very simple stuff that helps define the piece. I don't even know if it's titanium. I th it might be. Uh, <laughs> I'll be spending too long talking through this. But really great, I think, as, as far as the surface finish goes. Nice and neutral. White dial, textured, good detail. Uh, yeah. David saying, amazing how designs can get 99% of the way there. Stumble at the finish line. Tudor and Grand Seiko, our hands are non-starters for me. Why did Grand Seiko chop the hour hand? I don't understand brands with their design directions. I, I get you. I didn't even notice that. I honestly didn't notice that. But I see here that they've, they've cut the tip off. If circumcised it, whatever you want to say, N not a good look. It's not a good look. They did it to keep it cleaner, I guess, to leave a space between the, the batons on the dial. If it was me designing a watch, I would want the hand to touch the baton. I know that's not for everyone, but it just closes it up a bit more. Quite unfortunate that they've decided to cut it away. 
for the minute hand, you need to have it all the way along so that it touches the minute track on the outside so you can tell the time easily. I don't know. I also think it might have been done to frame the date window a bit better. Mm. Great point, though. Great point. I didn't even notice. Again, I'm looking at this from the first person. You guys are lucky enough to see it from a smaller side. You can actually see what's... I'm looking at this at a 5K monitor, so I'm, <laughs> I'm probably missing all the details. Also, just love how they do their polishing. There's there's nothing you can ever complain about how, how Grand Seiko does the facets on all the edges of their watches. There aren't any more photos from... from oh, there are. That's good. Worn and wound. Uh, the fact that they get these edges so well finished and, you know, Zuratsu, we talk about that very often. It's about the dial. <laughs> Thanks for that, Brian. Uh, the dials are all amazing, but I think the the elegance cases are much better. Yeah, the elegance cases are more like turtle shaped cases. Hey, they're, they're rounded, beautiful. I mean, they've done some in like in like silver finishing. They're gorgeous. Um, for me, GS is perfect choice for dress watches. Fifty fifty as a sports watch. Good point there, Instablan. If I am missing you in the chat, please repeat your your comment or tag me. I'll be able to catch it. Grand Seiko dials and cases great, but boring watches really. Uh, horror jewelry lawyer that's yeah good point that's another thing that turns people off from grand seiko i think it's the downside of being so good with, it's actually seiko as a brand i i felt the same way with that prospects diver i want to do a talk about it later um when you get something so well done without fault without you know that the character lines that you want out of a watch that brings you back to look at it and question is this loading up there we go we're back uh you, you can lose interest in the watch. You can very easily lose interest in the watch. The dial is its redeeming quality. It's a feature that's always going to have you looking at it again. But as far as the overall package, case and bracelets, not as exciting. Excellent point about the elegance cases. Those those rounded lugs are so beautiful. And there's so many good examples of those out there too. Look at how good this dial looks with no power reserve. Great point there, Toba. They took the power reserve off. I believe the power reserves are only for the spring drives. And since this is a high beat, this doesn't have a power reserve. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. I might be completely wrong there. Sometimes I slip up on these things. Yeah. And the Grand Seiko, Grand Seiko, I've, I've said this about a trillion times. If it was me designing this watch, I'd put the Grand Seiko at the 12 and do something about the name underneath. The, the actual logo should be at the top. I think that would finish it off very, very nicely. Um, I was just Googling something about Zeratsu polishing and an article included a pic of a Vacheron overseas with small seconds at nine o'clock. I love it. There's some, really? But overseas with, I'm thinking of the traditional. There's a watch that we featured last week, last wrist shot week. That was amazing. It was a, the, the, what's it called? The traditional, the Vacheron traditional. Okay, next piece that's on the list. Another Grand Seiko. This being the GMT. Uh, let's see if I can get this right. Seiko GMT. GTM, that'll do, 2021. As, as Grand Seiko does, they bring out a series of different colorways every single year. And this year, let's see if I can find something that's not pixelated. Hodinkee is always going to do it for us. I believe this is a part of the collection. They, they've done cherry finishes on certain models. This year, the GMT got the love. And yeah, stunning. Again, appreciate them for their dials. The GS GMTs are one of the best out there. I think the case and everything speaks very nicely about the watch. The dials also superb, superb looking dials. I would not put 80 hours on a dial. No, Forbin, good point. It's a little bit, it's a little bit weird. Uh, why need, why feature the power reserve lines? OS with small seconds at the nine is the ladies model, I believe. Marco, welcome. I think I said hi to you at the beginning. Welcome to the show. And Sean says spring drive power indicator on the back now. That's a good move. That's a really good move. We've we've chatted about it a lot, I think. The whole concept of if you're going to have a power reserve, force people to look at it on the case back because you know it, it makes people look to the movement and it's just one of those things you can enjoy. This is a great looking watch. I think the way they've addressed the green here is also also very nice. And the dial, when it comes to being just a standard dressy sporty machine, you want that complexity on the dial to keep your in to, to keep your interest, right? Uh, you don't need a power reserve on an automatic. No, you don't. You really don't. Grand Seiko cases are thick. Yep. There, there are many other issues along the way. I mean, if we're talking about quality control with bracelets and all of that, the fact that the clasps are not milled, they are normally just stamped more often than not. These little things are detractors that are a pity. 
The Whirlpool's beautiful. Yeah. Yeah, the Whirlpool dial is amazing, Mark. I agree. I would totally get onto it, but then we'd be so sidetracked. My favorite has always been that Peacock that came out two or three years back. Such good finishing. I mean, I, I love the work they do with a lot of their pieces there. It's all about the dial and the red band. Yeah, it's really good. So Grand Seiko brought out some good stuff. 2021 was a good year for them, I think. But a lot of the time, as we will notice as the series goes, most, most launches were color shifts more than anything else. What's the size of the green model? I believe it was a 40 or well, 30, 38, round about there. So not a, not a hugely big watch. Maybe 39. Seiko likes to play with those in-between sizes. So maybe 39 millimeters all in all. Uh, a power reserve indicator with co was coaxial, our minute hands. St. Peter, interesting point. Okay, so let's move on to the next one. What else did I highlight here? Okay, so now we're jumping to a different area completely. The 50 Fathoms No Rads. Uh, Let's see if I can pull it up. Please don't give me the modern, the, the vintage stuff. Was this, is, was this a Hodinkee limited edition? I really hope it wasn't. But this one, there have been so many of these military inspired mil spec models that have been released. And this one, this one I really like. I mean, I, it's divided opinions. Blancpain and their, and their 40 millimeter military inspired models, they, they can be hit or miss. No rad, no thanks. <laughs> I just, I find it great. I don't know why. Uh, as far as being a limited edition, it's a pity. We've said this about a trillion times too, that Blancpain should just make this a part of their production line. How many of these watches would they sell if this was a part of their standard production line? So much more interesting than just your everyday Tudor Submariner, you know? Uh, the faux weave strap is weird. Oh, talking about the Tropic. Yeah, this is, this is how Tropic straps have always been put together funky funky things got a fist shot for someone who might appreciate it uh matt dial i don't know how many of these they made probably like a hundred or something and they're all ridiculously priced now because they're on the gray market but as far as blanc pond releases go this was the one that was the talking point uh, i think they did a bathos scaff in the later months wish they made more 40 millimeters yeah I don't understand why they feel so driven to make only 45 millimeter modern pieces that they do once we hit the 2000s, they decided to scale up their 50 Fathoms line and just stick to it. Reserve Commander, the, the Omi, oh my goodness, I'm not, I'm not going to say that. The, the case back might trigger tryptophobia. Oh, <laughs> I'm not, I, I can't pronounce the Japanese. I need more coffee in me to do that. But uh, yeah, I don't know. Instablain, you guys are chatting on about, I don't know, perpetuals. Uh, Neff says, can't they just make a normal 50 Fathoms in a 40 millimeter already? Good Lord, what a waste. Right? I don't know. I don't know why, because this watch, as it is, the, the, the size of the bezel, all of that, the, the presence on the wrist, it's all there. You don't need to do much to get this watch to sell, realistically. I'm going to speak about a, a reissue of sorts later on. There was also a piece that caught my attention over the year, also one that was widely loved. This is the original model. I, too, I do wish they kept the skin diver case with these pieces, too. I, I don't mind the modern stuff with the squared off lugs, but the, the old school skin diver cases, things are just better vintage, you know? Vintage watches, there's some things you just can't take away from them. And excuse the pixelations, I probably have a very slow, slow connection this evening. What are you wearing? What are you wearing with this though? We're talking about like outfits. I find that there's a great versatility around oh, revolution. Come on, someone load up for me nice and easily. Uh, the Blanc Pound blog, that's good. So on the left, we have the Hodinkee. This is the Hodinkee issue that they brought out, I think, the last end of last year. And then this is the No Rads model. I think what's great about this kind of pairing with the Tropic strap or a NATO strap or whatever is that it works in virtually all situations, whether on a NATO, well, sorry, what am I saying? Works in all sorts of variations, whether you're wearing jeans or whether you're wearing a suit. The, the formality of wearing a watch today, it's, it's impressive enough that you're wearing a mechanical watch, let alone <laughs> what you're wearing. Uh, Horology Lawyer says, huge discounts, Long Pond 50 Fathoms, the brand has lost the plot. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's what's going on here. Huh? It is what's going on today. <laughs> Unfortunately, they are losing attention because they're just, they're not grabbing it. Their watches are either, they, they've gone in this direction of, of the dress line. I think they're still producing the Le Mans line, which are the more dressy pieces. Their dive watches hit or miss, especially when they're 45. And I think that that was X Fathoms that they did was like 50 millimeters or something. A big yellow hazmat suit. You've got to do it with no rads. 
you got to do it to follow through. Yeah, I just dig it. I love the novelty. You can, you know, me and my my designs and my old school inspirations. I think it's just so quirky having this on a dial. The fact that these were issued at a time when everyone was scared of radium, radium paint. This was like during the fifties. The whole no radiation act. The whole uh, what was it the what were they called? The loom girl, the radium girls, and and the whole court case going on through that time. Uh, this was just something to solidify, especially to the American market, that there were no radiations on the dials. There was there was no radium on the dials. It was tritium, so it was safer. Yeah, just crazy, weird developmental history. Also, just dig that they framed the window properly. Okay, so Blanc Pond, not too many great releases, but this one's definitely caught my eye over the year. Oh, cool. That was good timing. And then straight after it, we see the difference between the two. 50 Fathoms, Modern Take, and then the Tornic Ravel. This one also was a piece that I, this is a personal choice, I think, personal preference. I just really, really like what they've done here. The reason why it gets a big nod for me, if we look to just a, just a close up, let's see, one and one, will you load for me? I guess I have to go into these web pages half the time, huh? It's going to be slow. Let's do it. Let's go into a web page quick and have a look. If it ever does load up, anytime now, wait for it. Oh, the internet on the South Coast. It's not too fast today. What what I really like about what they've done here next to so many reissues that we see day in, day out. They didn't go the faux loom. They didn't go with old school crowns and all of that stuff. They've built it in such a way so that that's very small. Let's try and zoom in on it somehow. <laughs> yeah, that's what happens when you don't do these shows in a while. It takes a bit of waking up to do. Uh, so... Federico is now selling a Blanc Pond as a second-hand dealer. Yeah, Delray watches. He's doing pretty well though, right? He's doing very well with the pieces that he sells. Sorry that I'm sorry that I'm missing you again in the chat. I'm gonna try to scroll up. To be honest, all the high-end swatch brands are so poorly managed. Blanc Pond, Breguet, Jacques Hedro, mm, just not good. And questioning why, Marco, do you have any good points about why do you think that is? Is it just because the watches that they produce aren't appealing to people, or do you think it's because of things like service history, or do you think it's price-related? There are many, many good things, uh, bad things, that, that can draw people away from it. Junior, welcome. So uh, talking about this watch again, yeah, what I dig is the fact that they've kept it looking modern. This feels like the Blanc Pond for the modern day. You notice that even the 50 Fathoms reissues that they're doing, these military-inspired models, they're still going with the faux loom and all that stuff. This has kept it in that center ground, big crown. And you would expect to see this kind of watch being issued today on the wrist of someone. I love that. I think just that thought process alone was fantastic. So all good luck to Tornic Gravel. I've done so many chats and videos about this brand. I think we can definitely move on from this. <laughs> Mezzanine, <laughs> Bueller, yeah, that's it, that's it. So, yeah, this uh, Tornic Ravel is a great story. I, I love the history. I think the name's great. As far as a watch that represents a bit of Swiss, a bit of the U.S., yeah, it's fun. So, excellent bring back. This was one of the watches that has caught my eye over the year. Doxa. Now, Doxa did some cool things. Uh, this being the Forge Carbon variant. I, I love this watch. This is just personal preference once again. But I, I freaking love what they've done with the whole Forge Carbon finishing. It's fantastic. I know it doesn't doesn't make sense. It drives the prices up like crazy, crazy high. But I think a dive watch with this finish and it being a doxa, aqualung, and, and the colors are just superb. They nailed it. It's it's got that stealth, but it's got that technicality. WJA, yes, there's going to be a Zenith later on. Yes, yeah, so I think these are the 600 Ts, right? Or the 300. These are the 300s. They also brought out. There was another model we can look at later on. I can pull it up in a second, actually. Yeah, oh, just a great combo. Here's the original, the original 300. And they've just gone to the next level of introducing new materials. And this is something we've actually noticed across the board when we look to other pieces. I didn't feature the, the ceramic Black Bay from Tudor. Maybe I should as far as releases go this year. But another thing that we're noticing is how materials are being introduced with watch cases. And that makes a big difference. You know, it just adds that variety, that diversity. We're moving away from the typical stainless steel stuff. We're starting to see titanium and forged carbon, which doesn't make a lot of sense. I mean, it shatters. It shatters on impact. But, you know, um, carrying on through in the chat. Let me try and scroll up and see if I've missed any more of you here. Yeah, it was a good point, Marco, about the um, 
the whole talk around the group. I'd love to know your thoughts about why you think and what you think you could do with, with the Swatch group in general, because you're right. I mean, Brega especially, when we're talking about service costs and all of that in between, how all of these watches pretty much tank by the time they're bought. Hmm. It's a difficult thing. It's a difficult, difficult thing. The logo is what makes it, though. Even the Hodinkee is slick. Yeah, logos on watches. Talking about the Blancpain. If we look at Doxa, the way Doxa does their stuff, it's just so instantly recognizable. I love the design of these watches. It just captures that transition out of the 60s into the 70s with the cushion cases. The finishing is, is so good. The, the asymmetry, the offsetting, it's not the easiest dive watch to read, let's be honest, but I think the, the whole package is just so well done. And listening to the chat. So Marcus says, I think the lack of a real luxury sports watch, definitely sports watch definitely hurts all those brands. No matter what they say about Blue Dial luxury sports watches, they are what people like and want to attract people. Yep. Good point there, Marco. Yeah, it's a difficult thing. We're in the stage now where the sports watch is the thing that defines most brands. Marbleized forged carbon. Is that the case, Roar of the Tiger? I did not know that's what they call it. I thought this was just their, their way of finishing it. So good. I mean, the crystal is nicely domed and so many nice qualities about it. These aren't cheap. I mean, these are like six grand plus, I believe, if we look to the prices. Uh, but all in all, 38 power, 38 hour power reserve, pretty short, all things considered. Okay, so what, four and a half, the Aqualung limited edition, 3,700, is that it? That's not too bad, realistically speaking. You have to really love the watch in order to get it, of course. You have to be a real Doxa lover to get into one of these pieces. But, I mean, the variety that Doxa offers, another great brand. I talk about Longines enough, but Doxa is another one of those brands that you should go after. What was that one that they did with, um, it was Time and Tide, I think. Eh? Let's see if I can pull it up. We actually featured it on a wrist shot week last week, or whenever we did the last show. And they've done something similar. They've brought back a classic design, this being something right out of the 70s not to everyone's liking and tastes i think most of us prefer the quote unquote icon in the edoxa line but again skin diver in a way kind of zenith defy ish the way the cases have been done julian says i got the doxa 300t two weeks ago yeah that's goody i guess one would have to worry about being magnetically hurled into an mri machine <laughs> forbin says yeah, angular look is also good. It's, it's yeah, again, not to everyone's taste. As we move through these watches, I think Doxa in general is quite a niche brand all in all when we look to just the way they do their cases and the handsets. I mean, not everyone loves the 70s, just overexposed handset and everything, but great watch. I think well worth looking at. Marbleized, <laughs> that's the finish resulting from the process. Yeah, Roll the Tiger definitely is, definitely is. I did not know that that's what they called it. I always just thought this was called forged but apologies about that great looking piece dig them next up what do we have iwc now they have had a pretty good year all things i brought up the big pilot 43 because i thought it was worth sharing i love that they've thrust this watch back into the limelight i will uh, bring up a page monochrome is a beauty so I, th I think on the left is the Petit Prince. I might be wrong. This No, they did so many big pilots back in the day. But here's a good side-by-side -side to see the differences. I'm sure most of us have been able to try on these watches this year. The big pilot is just everywhere. And I find it amazing how <clears throat> where, where the real attention went back to IWC was that whole John Mayer episode. That Hodinkee John Mayer episode from like what, 2014, 2015? I don't know when it was, but remember when they all when, when Ben and him sat down and they chatted through his his collection that he has and really getting into the details about how these watches have impacted him as a day-to-day -day piece. It's so awesome when you get to find a watch that truly defines you as a as an owner. Kelsowitz, welcome. Welcome to the show. Yeah, I don't know. This this is one of these, you know, just yearly wrap-ups basically it's not going to be too in depth but we're just going to run through a few pieces that have caught our attention over the years so many evolutions of the big pilots it's crazy 2016 they did a reference i mean the, the the articles on these are so great but the 43 millimeter has brought it back down to earth which i think is pretty exciting the one downside of the big pilot for a lot of us is you know going 44 mils and beyond on the wrist it's huge it's huge 43 millimeters though i think is fantastic 
because when you're talking about the application of the watch, I think it's great to factor in its size. So Longines Big Eye, again, I'll reference that I had earlier on the show, 41 millimeters, legibility is superb. And that for a pilot watch is ideal. Another example here, you're taking the pilot watch formula and you're making it the great size to be a daily wearer, but also something that is very legible and could be used in its you know, utilitarian arrangement. And Thomas mentioning the Mojave Desert, that was a goodie. That was a goodie. We can pull that up at the later stage. I think just this one is the piece that everyone's been talking about. It's It's been the one that has, yeah, just so good. There's been so much good press around the piece and understandable. I think they nailed the proportions. Uh, the mezzanine saying so good. Looks like an Oris. Yeah, I mean, Oris did a, did a pointer this year, which was pretty cool. IWC Blue Dial almost gets me each time I pass the dealer passing through the airport. Right? It's right there. They also, I, th I think they did a blue and a black dial. I, I, I remember right. But so many things they've just nailed. It's it's the simplicity, which is great. This watch, I mean, the big pilot has defined the brand. The way they've integrated a strap into the watch, that's something else. They've tried to make it a bit more dressy. But I mean, there's not really much you can fault here, which I also really dig. Gets to a stage. I think this is why we love the utilitarian nature of these pieces is that there's not much that you can say could be improved. The handset is ideal. The, the second hand, perfect length. <clears throat> IWC Schaffhausen, greatly arranged there. Would have preferred a cursive script. I mean, you've got to love cursive script from the, back in the day. The automatic printing. I guess that's a bit on the nose. You don't necessarily, so many brands do it today. So you've got to give them a pass on that. The crown is well sized. I mean, this is what the, the diamond crown is what's pretty much defined IWC as a brand today, which is good. Yeah, it's a goodie. And there was, there was another one that was mentioned that I, hold on a sec. I saved the name. Uh, no, I didn't. I've really kept this list short in order to keep the show from going four, five hours ahead. Chronomaster Yoshida, WJA, please um, please remind me of that later on because we are going to get to a, a Chronomaster in a second, in a little while. Silver and Blue Dial is just the single most iconoclast pairing since Dali and Hitchcock. That's interesting. Interesting references there, EMC. Uh, I'm going to try and get your name right. I get the same vibe with this year's Nomos Club Sport Pneumatic Blue Dial on an Oyster-esque bracelet. Yeah, I mean, Nomos, they've... they've they made this racing model. They did that whole the, the track watch with that that rally strap that they try to do, that metal rally strap. Don't forget about the new pilot Spitfire double numeral. I believe there was one that was mentioned. That's, I'll just type in 2021. I'm sure we'll get all the, um, the Mojaves and other models. They did some good stuff. I mean, they had that full, I mean, look at this, this perpetual. IWC perpetuals, one of the best laid out perpetual dials on a watch, I think. Probably, you know, in that category of like top five in the watch in the watch world. Let's see if I can get a close up. I'm going to have to go into Revolution to look at it. Hold on a sec. No, I can't get into it. Hmm. Let's see. Isochrono. That's better. Can you see that? Okay. Probably one of the best perpetual arrangements. It's I believe the only one that has a full moon phase for northern and southern hemisphere. It's one of barely a handful of watches that actually focus on that and for a pilot watch i mean it's it's a dream you've got the full year at the base there it's it's good it's really good is this an annual no it is a perpetual it's a perpetual that's yin yang yeah right it's fantastic i mean if it was me i'd probably go after one of these i know it's ridiculous they they, they hella crazy money but so good mr gmt welcome sir great to have you here ah yeah just just superb if I can try and get a full, let me try and get in somewhere. Of course, when we click on this, it's going to take us to Watches and Wonders, which will be a long haul. So I'm going to try and keep it short and sweet just to save us some time today because it's going to, I don't know how long the show is going to be, especially pulling up other references. Of course, the Spitfire was an important one. Uh, what else? A lot of these images don't load in properly. This, there was a model similar to this they brought out. You won't be able to see that, will you? Hmm. Hype beast. Don't let me down. Was this released this year? There was a model similar to this that came out that used the big pilot styled hands that was a talking point. Perpetual calendar and serotanium. It's amazing. Yeah, you know what I mean? It's like as you get into each brand, so you just fall further and further down the cavity, the, the, the cavity that is <laughs> each brand. Isn't this, didn't they do something here? Wasn't this a watch they brought out this year too? This was like a full ceramic case that they also blended next to the Mojave Desert model. <laughs> they did. Yeah, it just goes on and on and on. 
sucks to be Lewis Hamilton. He really got that was an interesting result this year. What a what a freaking crazy final that was. I don't know if you caught the Formula One. <laughs> I mean, I haven't been watching Formula One, and I just decided, you know what, let's watch the final. And then we saw that showdown in Abu Dhabi. That was um, entertaining, to say the least. Mark and Jack, Adrian, welcome, sir. Good to have you here. That's when you know that that we are not busy. It's a funny thing. This time of the year, everyone's like tuning down, quietening because of what's going on, Christmas and everything. The fact that we have time to hop onto live shows. Welcome, Adrian. It's great to have you here. The Big Pilots, one of the best releases of the year. This next to the Speedmaster 3861, one of my top choices, I think. They have hit it out of the park. It's so, so good. <laughs> Clam, thank you. It's great that you guys are having chats in between in, in between the comments too. So I'm <laughs> forgetting them. Should I find a Mojave? Yeah, a blog to watch. This will have to make me, hold on. Monochrome, monochrome always hits it well. Yeah, so the Mojave, unless you're sophisticated, the Mojave. I've, this was great. The whole desert sand thing was superb. The ceramic case, again, I mentioned it earlier, the whole idea that they brought out ceramic for, for the Black Bay for the first time and, and grabbed it in. Researching cameras. Oh, man, I know. <laughs> I just got a camera. It should be streaming at the moment. You should, instead of the ID logo, you should be seeing me. But in order to get the Sony to stream, I have to take out the SD card. I have to download new software for the camera. I have to download new software for the Mac to stream as well. It's freaking, just when you think life is going to be simpler, getting a camera gets 10 times worse. Yep, uh, I know it. <laughs> this, this hobby gets, yeah, the camera, the camera world. I've, I've just fallen down that rabbit hole and it's, it's been 15 years since I've owned a camera. It's going to take some time to, uh, to learn. I'm interested in knowing, yeah, what, what camera are you looking at? Adrian, that'll be interesting. Um, yeah, I was so close to buying. I was thinking of getting a Leica camera, actually. But then, because it doesn't have a display screen that I can see pretty easily. Yeah. Anyway, going to carry on through. So from 12, we're jumping to 13. <laughs> I don't know why this watch is so early on the show. But, I mean, this is how... I think it's Platinum, right? Platinum. Hold on. Platinum Royal Oak. Just... This this was an insane end of year model. So this was Q3. I think this came out pretty recently. And as f we compared the night and day difference, I'm going to jump into monochrome and have a look at it. The night and day difference between this watch and the Tiffany 5711. This is this is such a good like blend when we compare them side by side. The 5711 Tiffany dial is just a watch to gain attention. This was a subtle release in comparison. Uh, emerald dial, Fume, beautifully finished. It's a, it's a jumbo. The jumbo has been discontinued. And then in platinum, you don't, even, you don't even need to ask what makes this watch special. Of course, the green dial is a little bit cliche, but oh, it's good. It's good. Leicas are great for pretending you use a camera <laughs> or something. Yeah. I love the designs, though. I'm one of those guys who just love designs at the end of the day. Uh, yeah, it's a goodie. Looking at the Sony A7. Oh, God, it's camera talk. What are we going to do? Uh, another satisfied customer. Yeah. Now I can agree this is a great take. Yeah, so next to that 5711, that Tiffany dial, this is how to do it well. This wasn't something that was hotly spoken about. I think only a handful of pages featured it. Of course, it's a limited edition, too. The Royal Oak has been talking, talking about to death. But in the same way, the fact that this was so subtly done and released, end of the era, yeah, exactly, horology lawyer, end of the era for this watch, good ending, very, very good ending. And we're talking about the, I mean, they go through the whole history, 1972, the jumbo, it just gets further and further in. Some amazing developments. I don't know if, if you've followed the, the vintage AP Royal Oak rabbit hole, but when you look to like the 34 and the 36 millimeter models, there's some good stuff to find out there. Even today, like um, a quartz, a quartz variant. I know quartz APs can be a bit toxic if you if you pick the wrong one. But uh, as far as pretty good value for money, if you get one in full yellow gold or whatever, you can enjoy it. I've experienced a couple of them, and they're great, really great buys, good little pieces. Yeah. So this, I mean, monochrome goes through the full extent of the article, but great piece. What I want to know is, notice in the center of the AP logo, there's this little white section that don't seem to feature it here in the image i'm wondering if this is a loom element or not who knows yeah good piece really good piece nice example 
one of the most interesting APs that I think came out this year. They also did this whole 43 mil offshore offshoot and they had guys doing parkour and all the advertising, which was a bit hectic. I didn't really understand that. It's not like when you strap on an offshore, you want to go do parkour, but I guess, you know, whatever floats your boat. <laughs> AP has jumped the shark with Royal Oaks. Code 1159, but it'll take 20 years for people to realize it. That Code 1159 delayed fuse i think it's going to be one of those reminds me of a moza good point there jay um dial's very unique of course being a fume dial yeah um i think the code 1159 is going to catch on over time ap just needs to keep modifying them if they drop the prices of them a little bit more being that quote unquote entry level watch that brings you into the ap brand they could do a pretty good job with it um i remember that in the past live stream would be epic if it would loom yeah right would be <laughs> most ap owners also do parkour it's ridiculous right i just if you've seen the advertising on instagram and stuff it's it was hilarious it really was hilarious that green with a dark green suede blazer would be amazing i mean it's beautiful i'm not someone to talk highly about royal oaks and and the genta designs a lot of the time i'm in that phase of i like it one day i don't like it the next but the subtlety of a fume dial next to the typical stuff that we see just bright green or bright blue uh, you can get so much more out of it i see samra joining us welcome sir they wear large on the wrist unfortunately talking about the offshores yeah they're monsters another thing to, to add in is that the size of the watch usually goes up two millimeters because of the genta design cases and everything if you're getting a 43 mil offshore it's going to wear like a 45 if you get a 36 uh, ap royal oak then it's going to wear like a 38. It's it's pretty interesting how it all factors in. Yeah, belongs in a museum. Yeah, it sure does. Okay, they're going to carry on. I don't this this jumped to image 30. I don't know why it's doing that. Okay. Now this watch. This was recommended to me and it's called the Studio Underdog. I'm just going to say watermelon. Now, I mean Adrian, if you're still watching with us, I don't know if you if you've got me in the background blithering away. But I know that you did a review on this. Let me try and pull it up. This is actually great timing. Um, here's your shot. That's great. Now, I remember seeing this. I must have been like head, head first in a toilet or something and just not paying attention to what was going on. But this watch made the rounds on YouTube. And I didn't see a single clip. I do remember seeing <laughs> the color. But I didn't look into the watch. It was just something that, that caught, my, caught my eye. And I, I just... I didn't look at it again, but this has been one of the most successful micro brands of the year. Watermelon. Yeah. So this, this is the talk. And I believe he's an industrial designer who came up with this and gone with the whole concept of, I mean, go with watermelon seeds for the numerals, the offsetting, the numerals, the north, offsetting the text on the dial, the texture, everything there. This using a seagull caliber, I believe. Yeah. Just, just really good. And Injecting that life. We were talking about color at the beginning of the show, the whole coral reds and Tiffany's and, and blues and Helios, the sea fourth and all of those pieces. Um, this, this watch is another one of those examples that brings a bit more life and joy into a collection. It's great having the sterile stuff, but it's also nice to see diversity and bizarreness too. I, I, I'm not the person to consult. I think Adrian would be better to be asked about this because he did have hands on time with these pieces, but some awesome colors, and yeah, I wish him all the best. This is this is great to see. He definitely knows his color theory well. I love how he's split up the color wheel on the on the main sub dial, and the tachymeter scale is nicely done. It's simple texture on the dial is always nice. The latest model is the mint chip, and just just so fun. Yeah, <laughs> watermelon with basketball textures. It just gets it just gets further and further in. It's fun and so well executed. The build quality is far better than the seagull. Oh, really? Really? Also love the little design details. Yeah, yeah. Seagull movements, by the way, not to be scoffed at. They are bulletproof. I, I would highly recommend them. Uh, just workhorses, true workhorses. Trouble for colorblind. Yeah, if you're someone who struggles with seeing your reds and your, and your greens, this is all just going to come out as different shades of gray. Not the worst thing in the world, but, you know, you know. Uh, I see Russell joining us. Uh, ladies and gents, thank you for hopping in. I mean, I did not, did not expect it. This is one of those shows that I... I barely prepared for. I just thought, you know, big eye sub dial is cool. It sure adds some quality. And just far as you know, a I can I can see a designer wearing this watch day in day out, going into the studio and all the rest. Great little watch. One of the best. 
micro brands of the year. Bremont Longitude. <laughs> now, this brand has had some interesting, interesting backs and forths on this platform, to say the least. But this watch is is really significant. It is truly significant what they've managed to, to crack out this year. I believe this has been their goal since they started the brand. The, the whole aim behind their mission statement was to bring British watchmaking back. And, or English watchmaking. I don't know what's the better way to say it. And it's taken them, what, 20 years to do it. Now, I, I love this because I own the Smiths, the Smiths W10, the classic little vintage piece, and one of the last made in England field watches and the whole that whole story. This being one of the first in 50 years that has been able to compete in that, that arena now again. Uh, watch by Design says this watermelon watch would go well with the matte Eggmaster watch. Yeah, the Eggmaster, that, that was a great, isn't that a like a stop? I'm trying to remember. It's a timer, isn't it? I'm pretty sure it's a timer. Uh, you wouldn't find this ID wearing this watch. <laughs> yeah, so this this is a fascinating thing for me. Opens my eyes quite a bit. The fact that this movement is now made in-house. I love the whole background. To, whoa, what did I click? Uh-oh. Magic Mouse. It's it's her time of the month again. Um, what's going on? I'm not clicking anything. Blog to watch. What are you doing to me? Uh, I think the whole approach behind this watch is good too because it's it's looking to Greenwich. Of course, Greenwich, meantime, being the, the element that's pretty much defined time, which is nice. Uh, the whole longitude arrangement. I love the history of longitude and how that course-corrected navigation in the world. If you don't know that story, I did a... Did a video about that a couple of years back. But the whole thought that you know, when you're navigating around the world, longitude is pretty much what defines your position, and that's what solved navigation, getting lost at sea, basically. And marine chronometers were very much the most important elements that helped that whole process. So the fact that they're using all of that as inspiration, and then just a good-looking watch. Take the name off the dial. Put any name you want on it. I think the arrangement has been very well executed. I dig the Breguet-styled hands, the fact that the loom is in the right place. It's got a manual wind movement, so the power reserve goes in and out. Pretty fascinating piece, to say the least. Um, Tom Hardy is still the unofficial ambassador. I'm sure he is. <laughs> Smart mouse is rebelling. Tell you what, all the tech is now dying on me. This is all 2015 stuff, and it's it's slowly but surely starting to give me the finger day in, day out. <laughs> yeah, like it. Uh, Ron just says, what is this? The watches I couldn't bear to look at until now special. <laughs> yeah, there's some good stuff. Oh, hold on. We're not, not going to get some good stuff later on. This, this from Bremont I think was good. It made lots of headlines, and I think for the right reasons. Awesome story behind it, and go and look at to the watchmaking that they're doing. The actual actual building going into these pieces. There aren't many of these around. They're only making like a hundred of them in this color and that color. Um, I'm, I'm they're not looking towards Greenwich, Connecticut. That would only help to find hedge funds. <laughs> yeah, the only thing I dislike is the crown more tapered. I find it pretty. I mean, we're talking about again. Bremont as a brand has been the one that's defined by its pilot watches more than anything else. And we were just chatting about the diamond crown of the IWCs. I think in a way, the big crown is calling back to that whole pilot navigator watch too. It's difficult to define. I feel this has a cross between a marine chronometer, but also aviation chronometer at the same time. like it. I, I do really appreciate how they've done this design. I, I think it's tastefully done, all things considered. Okay, next up. So we've gone from, from image number 30 to image number 4A. So I don't know what's cracking, but... We will get to the next, uh, if I can get out of this. Ah, okay, Omega again. Now, I had an interesting, <laughs> yeah, Omega, with, with the, um, the 386 one, they killed it. It was just an absolute win. Such, such a good launch of the year. This one, on the other hand, I was really excited seeing this piece brought out. Um, they're going even further back to their roots with the, the whole 50, 1957 inspiration. If you need someone who is just so keen on this inspired watch, this the original Seamaster 300s, ask me. Um, I'm, a, I'm a huge fan. And the way that they've done this, I like certain things. I like that they've modernized it in some places, but I also find that they've gone backwards in other areas too. The whole, um, you know, 
Panerai numerals on the dial, that the sandwich dial arrangement, it's good, but it's a little bit too old school. So they're like, yeah, they're, they're jumping in and out of really going. I mean, they've done that with that, that chrono. What was it called again? The chronoscope. They've gone back to 1940s and 30s inspirations all of a sudden. And then with this, of course, this line has always been more old school inspired. They've now jumped way back early 50s. We're talking like Panerai era all the way to, you know, that, that kind of zone. It's jumbled. And this is something that can be quite a head scratcher, but they've also done some good stuff with the, you know, good mention, this watch looks good in person. The, this watch with this finish, I think the bronze case really nailed it. That whole bronze gold thing that they went for was awesome. I, I don't know if I have, is that, oh, hold on a second. I'm going to find something decent to share. I think I should just pull up monochrome and we can have a look at it. I've got so many tabs running at the moment. Yeah, but then again, this is the the purest snob turning up his nose to a 300 that's a tribute to the watch that he owns. So I'm not the best person to ask for this watch. I do love the, the lollipop seconds hand. That's amazing. The bezel, I'm surprised they didn't go with the ceramic bezel. But all things considered, it's a cool watch. And yeah, the fact that it's bringing more people into the 300 line, which I still think is underappreciated, is also nice. The peanut butter, the Reese's peanut butter cup crown, also pretty good. Turbo, thank you for the super chat, sir. For more plain white t-shirts. Oh my God. Yeah. I've got to mix up the wardrobe. You're right. You're right. That's just when I'm recording, that's what I feel most comfortable in. I had the best comments when I did the face reveals thing. I had some people saying, um, I thought you were in your 50s and you wore a tweed jacket and you had a, a, a pipe in your mouth and everything. Very disappointed, you know, that kind of that kind of feedback. Uh, yeah, so being in my 20s wearing a t-shirt was a bit of a turnoff for a lot of people, but <laughs> Turbo, thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, it's a beauty, but slightly too large. The Spectre Limited Edition is the sweet spot. I mean, that's, that's from Jay. I, I think that's a great point. The Spectre is one of my favorites. I did a video about this watch pre-release. This was through leaked images and did a bit of an edit around it using the Spectre as the inspiration. I feel that this watch should direct itself more towards being modern instead of vintage i don't know there's something more about it being you have to you have to choose are you someone who wants to push the modernity of it or do you want to step back and look at the older the older inspired backgrounds it's a difficult thing to like define this watch has always been vintage inspired so i guess they're still keeping with that that arrangement but mm, yeah it's one that I'm on the fence about and I'm the worst person to ask because I, I own the original. So it's not the best, not the best thing to refer to. The Spectre and the New Man on the Moon, only Amigas are realistically considered. I mean, they're both great. The, the other, the CK2998, that's the one, right? Those those cases were also fantastic. This case, the fact that they're, they're still using it, I think also pips it. No lollipop hand needed. Also, another thing that divides opinion, the lollipop hand makes it even older. Yeah, right. Modern movement, vintage looks. And I think it's using the 8806 or was it the 8809. I think they've added a new caliber into this watch. Yeah, still good though. Both the, both the dial and the bezel, I think they've treated it the same way they have the Spectre, um, not the Spectre, what is it? The No Time to Die model. Um, is this, it's an 8912. I did not realize that. Yeah, some good stuff. I mean, the micro adjust is fantastic. Cool looking piece. Not for everyone, but I thought worth discussing because you know, it's good to see that they've given this a bit of a facelift since the original one. But the question is whether or not they're going too far back to the older styles. If it was 38, 39 mils, it would be closer to perfect. Smaller is coming back in vogue. Lord of Lek. I mean, this comes from someone wearing the 39 mil Seamaster as we speak. And yeah, I, I find that that does ring true. That does ring true. I do dig the lollipop pan. This is something that helped define this watch during the time when it was made. I think the lollipop hands came out between the dash fours and the dash eights, like round about there. There were there were eight or nine references in the CK2913 category. So yeah, you can see where they're grabbing their inspirations. This was one of the best. Sadly, not on a bracelet, but I think the leather strap also ties it nicely. They used a different handset. I mean, that that was the later the, the last of these models when they used this uh arrow hand stunning really really nice okay let's move on chatted about this piece enough what do we have next citizen let me try and remember this reference it's called the 
the zero two hundred. This was a, a recommendation, and I think well worth chatting about because it's an in-house caliber and not something we see every day from such an affordable watch. I won't go through all the specs and discussing it, but another piece to look into, especially in that affordability category, I guess the one downside is that it's going through that Genta phase again, like many other brands are doing. Uh, the No Time to Die is really amazing in person on the wrist, but that damn escape valve, I can't stand it. Yeah, uh, it's, it's that thing that has always either made people love or hate the professionals. That's, that's really funny. To, uh, uh, yeah, sorry, I'm going to get up on the chat again. If I can, I'm missing a bit more. Okay, good. I haven't missed too much. That's nice. So this, this, the Citizen logo, I have never understood what this eagle represents. I believe this is like calling back to, to old school Citizen branding that they've done on their pieces. Great texture on the dial. Again, if you've seen the integrated case and bracelet, this will probably bore you to death. Similar to like so many other watches out there today. But I find it pretty fascinating as far as a good release of the year that they're able to bring a watch like this out that's all in-house and worth yeah, worth your attention. It's a hot piece trying to make a statement. Small seconds is a nice touch. Yeah, good point there. I wanted to mention that. I don't know why more brands don't play around with small seconds. It just, you know, it breaks up the dial a bit more, adds a bit more excitement to the finish overall. <clears throat> also really dig how the quarters are emphasized. The quarters at the 15, the 45, the 12, a little bit thicker, similar in many ways to the, um, the Vacheron traditional series. I do like that. It adds a, a dressier quality to this piece. There's no denying that this is more of a dress sports than a sports dress. <laughs> Makes sense. A good citizen. Yeah, I like that. It's from Al. I haven't said hi to you, Al. Welcome. Uh, and Adrian's saying, love the design. Yep. Dial texture is awesome. It's good, right? I don't know why more brands don't play with texture. If not texture, play around with your colors. Add fume and stuff. Make it a bit more exciting to the eye. Oh, monochrome, you always nail it with your photos. They're just so easy to scroll through. Watch by design, thank you. This is Curtis. Curtis, I didn't even say hi to you. I, I mentioned you earlier. I hope you're doing well, sir. I really hope you're doing well, that side of the world. Yeah, it's great. Sucker for small seconds. It, it just, what can we say? It adds some more character to a dial. It doesn't look as typical, as atypical as everything else. Also, think the Dauphine hands have been addressed well here too, and the size is nice. Yeah, simple, subtle. Doesn't need to be bombastic. Doesn't need to be high horology to get praise. And I think they have definitely addressed it well. Good thinking. Similar in this category is the Tissot PRX. Not sure about the logo. Yeah, I don't. If someone knows the history behind it, I'd love love to know because. I did not know this was the original. It reminds me of how Orient does it with the lions and all that stuff. I guess this is a part of Citizen's identity. Um, <laughs> to be used for alcohol only. Yes, sir. Will do. I've been getting into whiskeys way too much. I, tr I tried an 18-year-old Banahaven. Oh, my goodness. It just gets better and better. I've learned that as you go through, let's see if I can find a good shot. Monochrome again. Let's chat about the Tissot PRX since we we're on it. The Powermatic 80, this watch, another great watch of the year. And for good reasons. If I can, I don't know if it's safe for me to zoom through these. Let's see if we can. Yeah, so the Banhaven 18 is another. I've just learned that as you move up through the years, so the alcohol becomes subtler and subtler to a point where you barely even taste alcohol at all. You're drinking alcohol. And yeah, once, once that cask starts seeping into it, gets dangerous gets really really dangerous uh what's in everyone's wrist this evening dan's asking i'm rocking the seamaster 57 i'm interested in knowing ladies and gents but the prx good mention from onar saying good value <clears throat> i think they have also i love the fact that this is a reissue of sorts it's paying tribute to an original model they made yes it's a bit on the nose with the whole tapisserie dial and the blue and the gentle inspired case and all of that stuff but you know what for what it does it does it well uh the bracelet's a bit chunky too. That's one critique I will also mention. But all in all, I think the subtlety of the hands, the, the batons around it, dressy, sporty. These two watches side by side are kind of like competitors in the zone. Black Bay 36. Did they bring out a Black Bay 36 this year? Uh, see, oh, right. We're talking about what we're wearing on the wrist. Sorry about that. Sea Dweller. Oh, Jay. It's my favorite one. It's a five digit. So 2254, Dan. So, so good.
it's very delorean yeah right very back to the future i mean it's it's interesting because we're in this phase now where everyone is going after these these variants and where does it stand for the future Do, is this is this a watch that helps to find the future direction for where watch design is going obviously it is it seems like you know that that whole retro futuristic vibe is the thing that is staying and it's still staying so that's it uh so so edwin would go for the for the citizen i think for that whole in-house arrangement and yeah, you know what? What I enjoy about the Citizen is it's not playing it as safe as the TSO is. Is that is that too bold to say? <clears throat> I like the fact that it's leaning more towards being a dress watch next to being just a tapestry dial, another one of those variants out there. Let me catch up in the chat. Explorer 36. We're going to get into one of those in a second, Pam. Good choice. No time to die, Omega from, from Onar. Awesome. 126600. Oh, the 43. It's one of the first. Uh, I think, no, no, no. It was one of those experiences that I've had with a seed dweller where I looked at it. It was one of those instant like wow moments getting it on the wrist. That 43 mil seed dweller is, is a complete package, I think. Amazing. No, the variants are coming after us. <laughs> the variants. Right. I like that raunchy. He's still dropping in, dropping in the one-liners. Good one there. The variants are coming after us. You got it. Got it. I should also mention, I hope you're all keeping safe and looking after yourselves out there, everyone. You've got it backwards. That's so funny. I'm wearing the new one, the Zen 103 Classic 12, Insta Blend. That watch I have featured. This watch, that watch is going to be mentioned in the show. Let's move on next to, I don't know what, what, what is up next. Right. Arnold and Son. Getting a little bit more heavy into this now. So Arnold and Son, I think it's called the, the Lunar Magna, I believe. That's the one, right? Oh, now you'll notice some continuation happening with the watches that we're going to look at. Uh, there were a lot of aventurine dials this year, by the looks of things. People seem to jump into the aventurine dials a lot, and I think what really draws me to this piece is that bare bones simplicity. It's not trying to be anything overstated. They only made a handful of these pieces. They are also rare and attractive. The whole the whole three dimensionality aspect's good. If you like the moon phase. Classic watchmaking. Mm. Yeah, it's it's awesome. And I'm going to carry on in the chat. I want to see what else everyone's wearing. I'll read it out loud. JLC Reverso Tribute Green. Oh, you got that just recently, V Marsh. Amazing. Cyclops on the Sea Dweller is a deal breaker for many. I'm sure me included. It's an interesting thing. I, I did a video about that probably two years ago now that the Cyclops is there in a way to hide the fact that the movement in the Sea Dweller is way smaller than you think. And that the date window is actually being shifted inwards. So what it does is actually make it look a lot more symmetrical. If it wasn't there, you would see a huge gap on the right-hand side where the date's been pushed in. But it's an amazing watch. really is amazing. Magna Luna. Yep. Hi, James. Welcome to the show. This is a goodie. A real goodie. Uh, I believe, I don't know if it's enamel dial or not, but 3D, print, 3D moon phase, not 3D printed. Just subtlety. Subtlety personified. Aventurine is a as a science. What's that? What am I trying to say? It's a manufactured material uh, to give you that starburst effect. And we're going to have look at another model later on in the longer category. Um, yeah, very thick. I mean, of course, with with all of these models with the three dimensional components, the crystals are huge. They're normally domed. So you got, you, you're kidding. You've got a Grand Seiko, James. This is news. This is news. Wearing my de facto Irons Incognito. I don't know what that is, but that sounds very cool. Uh, Arnold and Willis will be a better name. Oh, my God. <laughs> we've, got some, we've got some 80s references, 80s and 90s references going. I love that. Uh, I love it. Hope you guys are enjoying something good to drink, too. I mean, this is the time to do it, right? Saturday, this side of the world, Saturday, like half past 11. Look at that movement. And the moon phase being attached on the back, it's insanely good. It's just, it's overkill good. Yeah, I like it because it has it doesn't it doesn't shout about its its presence. It's very simple, but nicely done, very nicely arranged. Wearing an OP thirty six green, love it, love it a lot. I like that adventure in longer one. It's called the little longer one, I think. That was the suggestion, and just insanely good. Insta Blaine, my pleasure. The content of twenty twenty one. Thank you for the super chat, sir. So, you know, like these are always fun. You got to just. You gotta just enjoy the enjoy the creating process. When you end up getting bogged down doing the editing, and this is what makes live streams so fun, is that you don't have to edit them and all of that. 
when you get bogged down by the editing, you've got to just remind yourself that the watch collecting part is fun and it's great to share, great to talk about. Uh, 37, perfect size for a longer one. It's such a good watch. I can't wait to get to it. Yeah, so this one is definitely out of out of sorts for a lot of us. We can't, I mean, they've only made 28 of these like across the board. So not the easiest watch to get a hold of, but I mean, subtlety, watchmaking extraordinaire. Okay, Arnold and Son, great piece of the year. Next up, what do we have? Hermes H08. Hmm. This one. Interesting talking point. <laughs> Why is there an eyeball on your watch? I mean, that's a good point, right? The whole three-dimensional. Uh, yeah, it's weird. It is weird. Uh, let's get into monochrome and chat about this little machine. Adidas76, welcome. So, and and Javier, all of you that I haven't said hi to, welcome to the show. Thank you for, for stopping in. I'm actually amazed. There's almost 200 of you watching, and that must mean that it's very quiet in the watch space today. <laughs> I did not expect it. I really thought it was going to be a quiet show because... You know, not much has happened. The year is over. We're all kicking back, you know, celebrating the end of the year, going on holiday and stuff. That's great to have you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for all hopping in. Adrian says he loves the Hermes. I mean, this this was another, like, I think it was a Q2 release, if I remember. What an attention-grabbing piece this was. I think they have nailed it. It has, what did I say in the video that I did? I, I thought of it being like a futuristic approach to a field watch. It has all the quirks that you would want. It is a fashion-inspired watch. The movement made by, by Vaucher. We talk about this manufacturer so often, and I can never remember the name. There's the name. Um, just great. Size, proportions, presence, the numerals. I love little things like how the, the actual numerals are designed in-house by someone. They have their own bespoke numeral creator. This is something that divides opinion. Uh, it's just fun, fun, quirky. I mean, they're not the cheapest things. They are, they are titanium, but it epitomizes design, and I think that is that's a joy. And a oh, John, thank you, John. You've had an interesting experience over this year. Please share in the chat again what happened with your um, the, the Amiga that you got, and then you traded in the Zen for a what was the piece again? I'm trying to remember. Please remind me, John. But thank you for the super chat. I would love to to share that again. Another fantastic watch for the year. Futuristic approach to a field watch. Nailed it. <laughs> yeah, this is the coffee and the alcohol. Thanks. Thanks, Adrian. Um, that's just it. I Fascinating little thing. Will it stand the test of time? That's the question. It's one of those watches that rides the line of being future focused, but also does have the old school drawers. They have made, Hermes has made so many watches in their time. Oh, there we go. This is great. We can see them featured. I really fell for this one years back if i can get into it i really fell for this watch specifically for the italicized breguet numerals i've forgotten what it's called but uh, I've, I've always like associated hermes watches with this typeface that they used and seeing how they've just shifted the direction completely just totally out of left field look at all the the modifications that they made through this watch over the years bracelets good of course they had that whole system with a new class where they introduced to try and find that quick that was amazing will they actually show it the, the the caliber again being being made in the same factory i think a lot of these tiered brands are using the same manufacturer they're not sharing the please tell me they're sharing that damn it they're not the clasp on this watch the deployant is so well done it's very interesting it's got a micro adjust system inside it which is awesome so yeah, all in all, I, I find it fascinating because it's not looking to any other watch for inspiration. It's going along its own way, sticking to a more 70s approach, which is what a lot of brands seem to be jumping on these days too. Nice concept, but I'm not sure they could go that they that they that they could go together. Javier, I don't know. This is, what's the MSRP? Let's have a look quickly. I haven't even read out MSRPs. She also mentioned that most of these watches were featured on the live shows over the course of the year. Let's see, the graphene model, uh, US is 9,000 US, titanium, 5.5 US to 6, 6,000 US, depending on the choice of strap or bracelet. And then the DLC titanium model, 5.7. I mean, they're not the cheapest things in the world. We could quote unquote call them fashion watches in that category, but I think design wise, did a very, very good job. <laughs> Coffee, alcohol watches for the win. Speaking of which, uh, yeah, I'm drinking a Tumnavulin tonight. It's nothing special, but I've watered it down a bit too because it's 
it is like drinking ethanol but yeah i felt a bit hungover starting the show today just just that saturday it's the time of year i'm gonna take a hit from the whiskey quick it's that time of the year where the sun sets at like three i nearly coughed it out it was so strong the sun's setting at like 3 p.m and you don't know what is up or down don't they use a, a agent hall movements I don't, I don't know if that's a joke or not rancha i again i'm not a movement nut i wouldn't know but but that's just it um i think they're already sold out <clears throat> i mean like so many things when you look to hermes i pretty that orange strap i think that combination is fantastic hermes and chanel and and yves saint laurent all of their products sell out right you don't get discounts on these pieces yeah so it's a pretty good pretty good watch i'm impressed with how they brought this out definitely one of the most interesting pieces of the year um pina colada wow drinking grim Al alea lumen ipa oof oof so here we go john's mentioning what he what he got let me move to the next watch in the selection <laughs> this is gonna irritate a few people but i saw this last minute and i was like you know what let's feature this thing because it has a, a trick up its sleeve I know we're talking about a Richard meal right now. Hmm. This should be fun. Um, is the web page going to load? I don't know. It's, it's trying to load up a blog to watch and it's not happening. I really hope. Oh, here we go. There we go. Do we have any good live shots or are they all renders? Come on. Something live living. <laughs> now, why am I, why am I like featuring this watch? We'll get to it in a moment. Richard Meal is not a watch for everyone. We talk about, I can't go into Hodinkee because my web browser is busted. Um, and Hodinkee has all the best shots. Switz Watches Magazine has good stuff. Let's see. <laughs> Feeling mundane about the cabinet. You know what, Mezzanine? Um, <clears throat> I haven't had wine in a very long time. And last night I had a Merlot and a Shiraz. So nice getting back into wine again. So, so nice. Okay, I'm featuring a Richard Meal. This is not the watch that everyone loves. What time is it? Yeah, talking about legibility and all that. Damn my eyes. <laughs> Another minging RM. Right, let's chat about this quick. <clears throat> what I like about this whole thing, what made this an interesting launch is the, um, the system that they've incorporated to actually lock the rotor. You can adjust the speed of how the rotor spins in the automatic movement. Now, Technically speaking, I, this is also, I think this is in partnership with Rafael Nadal, correct me if I'm wrong. But what I find fascinating is that you bring this technology in. I don't think it's the first time. But that whole idea that you now have an automatic watch that you can lock the rotor, you can adjust it so that it doesn't spin out of control crazy. The th I find it quite, it is a bit juxtaposing in a way because Richard Mill always talks about how their pieces can take superior G-forces and all of that stuff. So having the system is a bit weird because normally their, their movements are pretty bulletproof, all things considered. Another thing I really love, and this is coming from someone who has, this is, this is a first, ladies and gents, I've jumped on the Casio bandwagon and I'm getting into Casio and I'm loving it. I saw this strap and I said, this is such a sick looking strap. But that's about it. Like the rest of the watch is pretty, nah. I, I think the details are where I get, get quite a kick. Because I'm looking at G-Shocks now and I'm looking to Casios and seeing how they how they make their watches intuitive. This kind of stuff gets me gets me pretty interested. Uh, design POV. Just things like how they do their crowns. I think this is why I've respected some things that Richard Meal does, is just the way that they manage to cap off certain elements. Is this the best watch release of 2021? No. But I find the complication quite interesting, worth talking about. And the strap just looks great. So there's the hot take. <laughs> Revolution anti-hero here. IPA. That's awesome. I haven't had an IPA in a long, long time. Great looking watch from, from Jasper saying, I mean, baby blue is pretty nice. I think it's quite versatile as a color, actually, all things considered. Another thing I wanted to mention is me and my love for Arabic numerals at the quarters. I mean, this is this is something I could go after. I like the 36912 can't read the time on it very well but you know what master of the subtle they are wristwatch experience they are i mean this watch just screams under the cuff no one would ever notice it beautiful okay so the only person the only people who should wear these are f1 drivers on the podium then they should take them off <laughs> yeah yeah and they're, they're sponsoring <clears throat> who do they sponsor now mclaren i think right yes yeah, so this one caught my eye it's not for everyone but you know what pretty interesting Right, Breitling had a year. Breitling and their releases, 
not for everyone, but I mean, they just they just dropped the bomb all of a sudden with the stuff they brought out. Let's see if I can find something good for us to share. Monochrome article, maybe deployance. No, let me go into images and have a look. So the Duo Graph Premiere just dropped in out of nowhere. Like no one was asking for this, no one expected this, and then just crazy. So amazing what they managed to pull out, and not just the the Duo Graph, also the Chronomat the super chronomat that they brought out another time. So what Brightling tends to do is they have this like delayed launch. They have a, a very subtle hint that they're bringing out a new piece. And then they're just, yeah, this was, this was crazy. But of course the, the thing that divided opinions, I don't know if they have a side profile shot of this watch. These all seem to be renders. The watch is thick. And when I say thick, it's like, it's like 17 mils or something. All mechanical, just, I think it's because they, they doubled the modules on top to get the split seconds. Uh, so we'll be looking, the height is 15. That's not too bad. 15.3. That's pretty damn thick though. Uh, water resistance, 100 meters. Good to take in the water there. But but on the whole, I think that the watch is a beautiful design, all things considered. It's not the best image. It's a bit pixelated. But I think the balance is there. It's, it's calling back to older pieces. And a great year for the stuff they did, the top times. And we could just pull in and have a look at the entire range while we're at it. I'll just say Brightling 2021. Top times are always beautiful. The, the chrono, Super Chronomat was amazing. I mean, they just don't stop. This, this, of course, being the Super Chronomat, if I can pull up something worth looking at. They brought this out in pistachio green, which was quite the, the contentious point. Yeah, the Ranchip 806. Absolutely my favorite, I would say. That and the 765, I don't know what I would choose. Since I've got a big eye, Longine, I'd probably go after the um, the, the 806. Love that Navi timer. Yeah, as uh, most of these, I don't know if they, did they do the, did they do the Deos this year? Correct me if I'm wrong. I don't know why none of these pictures are like well-sized. Let's go into this one next. <laughs> Excuse me for like, for jumping around all this stuff. Uh, a lot of these are just renders, which is a pain, but... Yeah, the, the, this lemon lime green color, avocado dial, that's a good one, Turbo. Yeah, Adrian says he loves the green dial. Interesting how the content creator has like this bright gray. It's really easy for me to catch that Adrian has that gray background around his name. That's really cool. Um, nice green dial for sure. It's so different in real life. This is not an accurate reflection. It's super bright. It's like radium bright. Uh, check this history. I, I love the fact that they go back to looking at all this. 1943 premiere. The Venus Caliber, 38 millimeters. Vintage Breitlings. We featured a couple of these on Wrist Shot Week over the course of the year. And God, from the 40s and 50s, Breitling on top of their game when it comes to design. And then the Top Time series that they brought out on top of it. Um, nice. This also in rose gold is beautiful. So not for everyone, uh, but I think there's the case thicknesses. Yeah, it's difficult to see when they're all next to each other in relation, but uh, it's pretty thick. Pretty thick machine. Cognac strap is really off. Cognac brown, yep, not for everyone either. But they did a full, like, is this a perpetual? I, don't, I can't remember. But they did a full calendar arrangement, So, and they just dropped it out of nowhere. Like, no one was asking for it. They just said, here you go. Time to time to excite people. Thomas says, top sign days was this year. Let's have a look at that. That was a stunner. Beautiful looking watch. I think the only, like, real reservation people have is because it has clear case back, two modules on top of each other, a boxed sapphire crystal, ends up being almost 16 millimeters tall, can be a bit of a downer. But everything else, in fact, imagine they put an automatic caliber on top of it, end up being like 18 mils thick. <laughs> uh, Bruce, welcome. Just waking up. Good to have you here. So, yeah, so all things, pretty good little watch. And let's have a look at the, the Deus. Let's see if I just type that in. The Deuce, the Deus. I'll never get the name right. This watch is one of probably, I would say, even a greater favorite over the course of this year. Uh, Deuce being a motorcycle manufacturer, I believe. Uh, where's a good shot of it? Uh, this is always the hardest part, is finding something worth sharing on the big screen. Listing on Chrono 24, that'll do it. No, let's find something better. Just have a look. If you have, if you have a moment, look up Breitling Top Times and be amazed by going into this image. Oh boy, here we go. Connection's not private. This is because my web browser is old and because this Mac is starting to show its edge. I haven't updated it yet, so it's giving me a bit of a... 
no, and I go into this and I don't even get anything worth looking at. That's always great, right? What are you doing now? There we go. Look up Breitling and the top time line. Such, such good pieces that they brought out over time. They had this bow tie variant, I think, that came out last year. And this one, so nice. I don't, I don't think they produced them anymore. I think they were limited. 18 millimeters thick is nothing to an Omega fan, right, Neff? That's it. That's it. I mean, watch thicknesses. It's crazy to think how some can get them so right and others can't. The one floor, the snap-on case back. Oh, I did not know that the top time had a snap-on. The, the Zorro, that's a clam walker. Yeah, top time Zorro is beautiful. So Kovacs says, 2022, the 50th anniversary of the Rolex mill sub. Kovacs, you were the one who, who gave me that information about the... Oh, I'm going to talk about that. I want to talk about that. Um, and James says, got the mushy pea pistachio. Yep, it's a goodie. And I mocked you. I was still going to mock you about it. I got to mock you about the premiere. Great watches. Breitling had a good year. The Super Chronomat is another example we could pull up very quickly. Um, what they did here is they got the size right. They also just made a great looking watch. It gave a, had a UTC module attached to it. Did Monochrome feature any of these things? Monochrome always seems to be reliable with, with the quality of images. Uh, anything worthwhile looking at. There's the gist of it, pixelated, very true to form, very classic Breitling in the way they've attacked it. Uh, they mocked you because you're jealous. No, I don't mock James because I'm jealous, Adrian. I mock him because I like him, and it's good. Okay, right. Let's get to the, the, the big guns. Um, oh, man. So the Pelagos FXD. I was really, really excited uh, when... How did I find out about this watch? I got a, I got an email. I got an anonymous email about leaked images that were all over Instagram about David Beckham wearing the watch and about the... I've been following the Marine National for a very long time. Yeah, Neff, you, you nailed it. You nailed it, yeah. I love the Marine National. I love the history. I love the Type 20s. I love the dive watches. I did a video about it that's like 30 minutes long that covers everything. It hasn't been looked at. So Marine National doesn't have a great following or consider. Marine National being French Navy. They have one of the most amazing collections of, of watches through history from late 40s all the way to the 80s and onwards. So we have the Snowflakes from Tudor, of course, that amazing history. And yes, yeah, so I found some leaked images that were shared to me. Thank you for sharing those images with me. And I threw some mock-ups and renders together of what I thought this would look like. Surprise, surprise, it came true. The only difference was that it's a four line and not a two line. That That's the Pelagos. Yeah, so, so this is this is the one, uh, the Pelagos FXD. FSD standing for fixed spring bars. The French Navy actually wears it. So it's the modern day mill sub. Yes, Kovacs, this is, this is like official. They make a two line you'll see a couple of images yeah i've just been head over heels with this watch and come next year i want to get one i hope that they're going to be doing a 2022 on the case back because as you know the, the 2021s are probably going to be the rarest because they're only producing them for a short period of time over the course of this year but uh, next year 22 i would love to get one of those because i was born on the 22nd of november so i'm like if this is going to be the next watch for me, I've got to get the 22 on the case back. If it was a two-line of perfection. Now, interesting about that point, If I can, I wish I could find a good... Hmm. Let's see if I can find... that. There's, a, there's some images. There's my old image that I put up. Um, if I find the military, I'll just... I'll type in military and see if I find something. If we can find the two-line next to it, there have been some great Instagram posts. Actually, in fact, what I would recommend... Look up watch history. Uh, watch history. I typed it into the chat. He has one of the most underrated YouTube channels out there. He's written the book on the Marine National background, well, a lot of Marine National pieces. He has such a great collection. And he has a YouTube channel that discusses. He just picked up one of these watches. If there's anyone you want to hear his perspective around uh, the Marine National, Snowflakes, Tudors, and all those, look at his stuff. And he found some good images about this watch, you know, being a two line next to the four line. In a way, I think the four line works better than the two line because it's, this was actually mentioned, uh, Showcase Watch has pointed this out, that the four line corresponds very nicely with the snowflake hand where the, the squareness of it, you know, tapers off 
and it works pretty nicely there. This next to it is the is the beforehand, the previous generation of the Pelagos. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a big fan of this piece. It's it's a real goodie. I've needed a Tudor in the collection, and I think this will be it. This will be the next one. So so come next year, hopefully midway through next year, this will be. Oh, it's good. It's great. I have the countdown bezel. I love just it's all that stuff. French divers, that's a kind of top wristwatch experience. Yeah. So I don't know what everyone else's think, thoughts are about this piece. Um, but Kovacs made a good point about military, that, that Rolex has actually taken out a patent when it comes to military. I don't know if you know this. I don't know how he found this information, but it's fantastic. Um, Rolex has taken out a patent for Millsub. They actually own the rights for using Millsub as a part of their their description. Now, the question is whether or not that's affiliated to Tudor or if it's going to be affiliated to the future watches that Rolex is producing. Most of us know that there's a Titanium Yachtmaster on the cards. That's probably happening next year. Just clearing my throat. Hold on a sec. Most of us know <clears throat> that there's going to be a Titanium Yachtmaster happening next year. I'm pretty, I'm, I'm like, <laughs> what, 90, 97% sure that they're going to be bringing out a Titanium Yachtmaster. Everything seems to point that way. And they could easily assign it to that. I don't know. But, you know, it's one of those things. I find it fascinating that they've brought back this whole military inspiration. The fact that this is an actual service issue tutor. I'm really liking the way they've done the blue. Fisherman's Friend. I think it's almost time for Fisherman's Friend. Oh, good point. 52 mil lugs lug. I've heard some interesting things about that lug length. Um, that it's more like a 50. Um, and and all things considered, you're dealing with a purpose-built dive watch. At the end of the day, I think it's similar to a pilot's watch when it's 43 and beyond. If it's for the application, works nicely. Um, clearing throat means drinking whiskey. No, I like I legit cough. When I mute myself, I'm coughing off the screen. I definitely don't want to cough into your ear, break the, break the microphone. Mm. <clears throat> so, so another thing that's a downside to this watch that not everyone loves is the fixed spring bar arrangement. Of course, because you can't put a bracelet on it. It's a bit difficult. And there have been some, I mean, Design Atelier, if you're still watching, he did a video about attaching a bracelet to the watch. Uh, personally, I'm, I'm wearing most of my dive watches on NATOs or leather straps. So this one this one tips it for me. I think it's nice. I love the dial case shape, but don't like the extra hash marks on the bezel fixed strap bars. Yeah, another thing. When I look at this watch, I think MOD Omega Seamaster in a way. That's what I, I get pulled back to. And if you've ever had one of those in your wrist, you'll know that it, it, there's something about that extra size and presence that makes it feel really, it's a tool watch at the end of the day. This is like the epitome of a tool watch. Trying to predict what Rolex will be making. Good luck, Andreas. I love that. It says, look at you trying to predict what Rolex is making. Yeah, I made a video about the um, the Yachtmaster Titanium. That was fun. I threw some, it's similar to this. I threw renders together. Don't know if it's going to be legit, but they've i mean rolex has disclosed that they're using a nitex strap and that's also i mean think of it this way tudor brings out this watch this year titanium nato strap also similar arrangement with velcro next year rolex titanium velcro nato strap same deal these two watches are being released in congruence with one another and we've been seeing that from time and time when we look to the Pepsi GMT from Rolex and then the Pepsi GMT from Tudor back to back two tones from Rolex and Tudor this is not the first time i have this the strong belief <laughs> i'm a soft pass in the tudor anton welcome uh, hope this finds you well oh, it's a pleasure having you here if this is the first time you've caught the show welcome yep just sitting back chatting letting the alcohol do all the work really uh, great watch one of my favorite watch releases of the year. I'm I'm so happy that this watch exists. It just it also just bugs me that there's so many people out there that don't necessarily appreciate the significance around this watch and what it represents and all the history that's gone into it beforehand. And they're just selling them off for three times what they're worth now because they can because it's it's the hot thing to talk about. Um, now there's no value nowadays. We we look to that bloody Patek Tiffany again. There's just there's that sense of value that goes into buying a watch that's missed because people just wanted to sell it or, you know, it loses. It's unfortunately, because of the Marine National Partnership and all of that, it's it's these asterisk marks that makes it a bit more of a desirable watch. And so it goes. Yeah, those spring bars, 
Imagine no lions. That's that's terrible. Uh, the French needed a white dove. So that uh, I knew, Rancha, I knew you were going to come up with that next. Wait, the military got a blue watch. They did, Foreman. Like that's the hype. That's the hype right there. Yep, FXD, one of my favorites of the year. We should also maybe talk about the Tudor ceramic very quickly. Why not? Since that was another one that that I I liked actually. I really liked the whole. Wants to send me notifications. I found that this was quite the interesting one to discuss too. They did quite a lot this year, right? They did a they did a chronograph, did they? <clears throat> was the chronograph this year or last year? I can't remember. But that got a great reception. Then they did the sterling silver and the gold and yeah. The ceramic is worth looking at though. Um what I found great about how they did this was that in a way, when you look to the price of this watch next to its competitors, they're trying to quote unquote democratize the ceramic case in a watch and maybe we will see further evolutions of ceramic cases used in watches very soon uh nice move and this was also like a, a new caliber that they used yeah master how was it meta certified right that was the next stage <laughs> this was an only watch model i think they produced so this is now meta certified there have been a couple of issues with these watches i believe <laughs> Yeah, did did quite a lot this year. A lot of skews of the same watch. You're right, George. Not only the black base ceramic, but in bronze. Jeez, what did they do? They did everything. They did they did ceramic, literally covered every material. Ceramic, bronze, the full bronze model, uh, then sterling silver, then gold. What the hell? And now titanium at the end of the year. Rather democratized ceramic years ago. They did, Neff. Good point. We always talk, we always refer back to that. It's a very good point. 925 Black Bay, nice in the metal, I thought. 925 is another goodie. And so it goes. Um, Uptick did a great. He did. He did. And I, I believe Uptick was the, was the guy who spoke about the, the issue with the watch, that there was a problem with the, the power reserve or something. This is what seems to happen quite a lot with Tudor when they bring out new movements like the GMT date window disaster, that they have a bit of a hiccup here and there. But it mm, makes me wonder just how the Black Bay ceramic would have landed if the Caliber MT hadn't been a part of the launch as well. Good point, Todd. Good point. Yeah. So these are the two watches that have stood out to me the most. I don't know why the sterling silver hasn't hasn't jumped out. It's a nice piece. I think the colorway is very good. But over the course of that whole series when they were released during Watches and Wonders, right? That's what they called it now? I can't even remember anymore. Okay, we move away from Tudor. Let's go somewhere else. Great piece. I enjoy what Tudor did this year. Even, even if the FXD was the real one that, that stole the show for me, at least, I think. Um the 369 bronze was a good config. I think we should just pull it up quick. Uh, 2021 Tudor bronze. Full bracelet. I also like talking about this one because what it's doing now, first time they've got a micro adjust system inside the bracelet, which was fantastic. I don't know if I'll be able to find anything worth sharing around there. But um, another thing I think I said in the video that it's i don't know why the brand doesn't advertise what the bronze is going to look like over time because this will eventually be like a light green as you, as you're probably seeing i don't know if the image is good enough it'll go like a light green color over time it's not going to stay beautiful gold but yeah that's just it um it's awesome anyway gonna carry on through enough stains the wrist the smell I, uh, where, where do we want to start with it it just gets further and further what else do we have in the lineup oh my god no oh. JLC, what do they call this? The quant, the quadriptych. Oh, God. This okay. Going to have to use some brain power on this machine now. Uh, we're talking about best watch releases of the year. Yep, this one was most definitely. I'm trying to find a good image. Oracle Time, will you give us something nice to share? All right. Just insanity. This watch. Just, I mean, where do you even start? So what makes this year special, 2021, is that it's um, JLC's 90th, no? 90th anniversary of the Reverso, because I think it was introduced in 1931. I'm not getting something right or wrong here, I don't know. But this this pretty much capped off that anniversary and had the most in, just insane work going into it. The one video I would recommend is, um, oh, what's this channel called? What's this channel called? Please, someone remind me. Um, ah, he had a great hands-on review session. Taking it easy and steady there, Thomason. Yeah, welcome, Thomason. Hitting some coffee. I think I need it. This reverso is just nuts. Now, on one hand, we could say, yes, it's not aesthetically pleasing. It's not beautiful. 
it's just a machine. It basically was made just to show that this is watch making extraordinaire. Watch advisor. Thank you, George. Watch advisor. Such a good video. I think I've watched it like three times just to see the hands on with this piece. Because of course, you can't get hands on with a watch like this. Uh, hitting the coffee quick. This has everything Tourbillon, Minute Repeater, the Lunar Calendar, which was ridiculous. I don't know if there's actually a good shot of it. Or was this was this the right? Yes, on the, the very the far back on the watch. There we go. What the hell were they doing? It's just it's it's so nuts. <clears throat> There's gearing underneath here. There's a full arrangement of gearing that's controlled by one button, I believe. One button adjusts a lever, which pretty much changes the gearing throughout the back. It is so insane. As far as as technology goes, aesthetically. Nah, it's a pass for most of us. But as far as forwarding technology and proving that watchmaking is not dead, I've said this 7 billion times. Might as well say it again. The beauty about JLC and the way they address the reverso is they don't build the reverso around the movement. They don't build the watch around the movement. They, they manage to put the movement in the watch. So whether you're getting the standard classic, nothing special, or you're going all the way up to the tourbillons and beyond or the perpetuals, you're not going to see a watch that goes against the the identity of what makes the reverso. They will just they will just make a way. It's like the engineer's approach. You're just going to make the damn thing fit regardless. You know, it's insane. As as a movement maker, yeah, Todd, good point. They are their, their core identity is being a movement maker. This was a mind blow. I highly recommend check out the watch advisor video and see the hands on with this piece. It's it's out of this world, crazy. Uh, I don't even know where to start with it. It's just so beautiful. We can just leave it on to talk about for a sec. It's a mic drop. Yeah, that mezzanine. We talk about best watches of the year. This was top 10 best watch of the year. Uh, and they brought out other ones. They brought out a, a beautiful perpetual calendar, I think, that was skeletonized. That was at a later stage, I think, third quarter. Um, Thomas says, I love Watch Advisor. Even showed on how uh, how to clean the... Uh, yes, I remember that. Yep. Yeah, I love his stuff too. I love watching his clips when I get it, when I get a chance. Um, just awesome. Not aesthetically pleasing, but I think what they've done mechanically is just, I mean, you can't deny it. It's just insanity. It's got the quarter of the year. I mean, the more you look at it, the more, how many complications? Let's see if I can find, I mean, it's, it's like 28 complications or something ridiculous. Full lunar cycle, I only made 10 of them, so whatever. Southern Hemisphere, Northern Hemisphere. I'd be surprised to know that not many brands actually have the Southern and Northern Hemispheres with their moon phases on watches, which is pretty cool. Um, you don't see that very often. No, I don't want to sign up. Hold on, hold on. Let's get to how many components, uh, not components, how many like complications? Oh, uh, since uh, you look at phase one, phase two, phase three, phase four, I think there's like over 20 complications that they added. I'm your host, Alexander. Alexander's great. This is awesome. I love his stuff. I love I love the free nature to how he presents too. It's not it's not um stoic like mine, where it's like always serious and stuff. Uh, it's good to have some some humor and everything there too. Uh, this JLC reverser could carry the nickname the Antikytheria mechanism. Yeah, just Antikythera. I'm pretty sure that was like a Greek Greek invention, right? I'm trying to remember. Uh crazy. Just I don't even know where to start with it. Just so, so much. But just as far as a flex goes, this this capped off most of the launches this year. It pretty much blew everyone's minds, as JLC tends to do with everything they do. Uh, awesome. Just awesome. The SLA 077 in the top 10. Uh, we did feature – I'll have a look at that. Please remind me about that, Nom, at the later stage. Okay, next up, what else do we have? Uh, let's see if I can move through. <laughs> okay. Right, it's back down to earth again. I like this. Uh, why am I saying 20? I'm saying Rolex 36 2021. Will it give me the Explorer? I hope it does. The Palm Fronds. I mean, this one This one is actually pretty beautiful in the metal. I don't know if you've seen any of these in the metal, but they are pretty stunning. But the Explorer is the one that seems to have gotten all the love. Let's get the Explorer up if I can. If if Adrian is still watching, I don't know if you're with us still, Adrian, but I know you picked up an Explorer 2 this year. So pretty sure the Explorer 2 was your uh, your choice of watch over the course of this year. The, I, I don't know if – I think you got the latest model too, right? It was the 1-2 variant. So getting into the 36 mil, the two-tone and standard. Let's chat about this for a sec. Some good design things to discuss. Juan, welcome to the show. 
Thank you for the super chat as always. I'm not featuring any of your amazing collection today, but yeah, it's been a good year and I hope you're well. Can't wait to get back into wrist shot week in uh, in January. It's awesome. Kudos, Alexander. Yeah, imagine he hops in. It'd be so good having um, having him on. Yeah, that's the biggest flex, as as mentioned. Just got my show. Yeah, it's good. Thanks, Juan. Thanks for hopping in. Um, so as far as explorers go, a, a, give, a give and a take on, on both ends. Uh, the, the way that they've gotten rid of the 39 completely and favored the 36 is an odd move because so many people love the Explorer now. And it's it's like you are, in a way, eliminating your audience quite a bit, where the 39 had a much wider range as far as an audience went. So it's questioning why did they backtrack down to the 36? If it was me in this position, I probably would have like, I know it's me talking millimeters here, but I would go like 37, 30, between 37 and a half. So technically it's, we call it 38 or whatever, you know, <laughs> dear artifact. A Christmas watch, I know you probably picked this up. That's fantastic. I mean, we, we've chatted about this watch all year, dear artifacts. So huge congratulations, man. Huge congratulations. Uh, so so this watch is, is great. I mean, what can you say about it? I've had a draw for the Explorer for a long time. The 36 is an awesome piece. But I've also lost touch with it, I think. I don't know. I, I prefer a bit more of a technical watch. Technically, this is, yeah, this is 35.5. Yeah, that's it. That is it. They did it because it's so much nicer. <laughs> yeah. The two-tone is another watch that seems to have divided opinions quite a bit. And I mean, there's the original. This is the one two four. The one four, sorry, the one four two seven zero. The two-tone model um is going to, I think, similar to the bluesy submariner, is going to be one of those delayed fuse watches that's going to grab attention over time. Um, it's got a bit of dressy elegance to it. And I'm not going to pull up the the original Submariner, the the what's it called, the first generations of the watches in two tone, but I think it's going to have that similar reaction one day soon. Um, yeah, dear artifact, I'm pretty sure dear artifact just picked up one of these watches. He's been after it for a very very long time. Rolex should drop a 40 mil solid platinum explorer. This watch in platinum would be so good. It would be so good. I agree. Uh, 36 Explorer is a woman's watch. Now this is the thing. We're going into sizes now. Where does 36 sit? And there was mention about how the two-tone is more is more favoring the ladies. And I agree, ladies are definitely going after the two-tones a lot. But I've actually featured this on Rishot Week a couple of times already, the two-tone. It's one of those delayed fuses. I think it also captures this moment in time where the Explorer's got a, a modern lift to it, but still has those older style cues. Yeah, so one hand, I think they have alienated the audience that wanted a bigger sized Explorer. On the other hand, they've made it, they've returned it back to its roots, making it a bit more accessible and easy to wear for a lot of people. But yeah, great piece. I th one of the coolest releases from Rolex. Interesting talking points, not the most exciting, all things considered, but I think they nailed it pretty well. As far as criticisms, I did love how the Explorer text was on the, the, the bottom row on the 39 mil. It's quite a pity that they eliminated. Do they have a photo of the 39 next to us? Please tell me they do. This two-tone does look pretty good. Uh, I don't think they do. But the way the Explorer text was at the base of the dial was also very nice. A nice element that tied it in back then. I don't know if the, I know the three lines at the top is more true to form. Maybe the balance would be a bit different otherwise. Dial size on the 14270 is the same. 5513 bezel. This is uh, readability as their plus comfort. I bike and work out in the Explorer. You can do this with 39. Yeah. So legibility. Legibility is also there. And I mean, that's what you want the Explorer for at the end of the day. If you're using it as a proper work watch, you want it for the legibility, right? Yeah, so the two tones, perfect ladies watch, retro classic. I do think this, similar to other pieces out there, this one's going to have a delayed fuse. They probably aren't going to produce this watch for very long, which is something else to factor in. This is probably going to be like two, three years, and then production's going to end. Yeah. Maybe, it does, maybe they did this in a way to make it controversial, quote unquote i mean the explorer is not a watch that you'd ever think would be in two-tone but but that's just it well rizzo welcome sir and the rest of you that i haven't said hi in the chat welcome maxi dial makes it so much more readable it does it sure does when you see this next to a 1016 you can see how much more legible the the numerals are and everything there clearing the throat again hold on a sec so i haven't even read the chat has dear artifact 
did you actually pick up one of these pieces it's so good if you did man i can't wait to feature it in the next next show they went down to 36 because more women and younger demographics are getting into watches because of social media indirectly via the apple watch kovacs that's a very good point the apple watch has driven it's done a lot of things it's driven more attention to watches and you know, the apple watch sales it's a very cool thing to chat about like about the industry and all that you think they're going to stop producing it in two years you mean totally We're talking about the two-tone yeah i think the two-tone is going to be a short run i have this feeling that it's not going to be one that stays very long um and i think it was just done in a way because th think about it this way when they brought it was supposed to be the explorer 2 anniversary this year 2021 uh what they decided to do was modify the explorer 1 which was a weird thing and to to basically celebrate this explorer anniversary they they did the two-tone that's why i think they went in that direction mm. and the story behind it as well dear artifacts is going to be great i can't wait to feature it should i have a look at the the, the the explorer 2 wasn't all that different they changed the hand a little bit they adjusted the case size and the, the width of the bracelet but all things considered i think the 36 mil was the one that everyone's talking about and as far as a favorite watch of 2021 goes lots of love for this piece whether two-tone or just standard in steel i mean they're, they're workhorses really are great little workhorses um great size look forward to getting one of these on the wrist it'd be nice to experience it do a re proper review uh, some surprises for january oh juan love the presentations always oh man it's a pleasure i got an omega because of you oh that cuts that's that's in the fields right there juan thank you love omega i love omega i think it's just because it's one of those those family heirloom watches that that's gotten me into it glossy dial another thing that's another thing that defines this instead of it being a matte finish yeah good little watch okay next up i don't know what is up next in the category yammer <clears throat> for the yammer gmt oh this whiskey is obviously working <laughs> squinting at this keyboard of course the mac keyboard doesn't have a backlight so i don't know the, on the on the desktop so i'm like i'm struggling here watches by sjx let's have a look at this little watch now of course you have to dot in watches that are more affordable more attainable on top of the high-end stuff they're going to be some crazy high-end pieces too um, that watch would not let you go if you put one on <laughs> i think nef i think i would bond with it pretty quickly i do think so but i also thought about it a bit that's the Seamaster for me does that already. It has the Arabics laid out. It has the bezel, which is nice to adjust. The next watch that I would like to get, whether Rolex or Tudor, is it needs to be one of those everyday wearers that I can really abuse. That's why I think the <clears throat> why I think the Pelagos is a goodie. Titanium, it's something different. It's got ceramic and everything, so I can use it hard. The the, the downside to the Seamaster is it's a more dressy dive watch. It's more of an occasional thing, so not ideal for everyday use. But good point, good good point. Okay, so discussing the Navigraph GMT, let's have a look at this for a sec. This is simple arrangement. Now this was actually announced as being a, a collaboration with the Marine National before so many other watches. I think it's still in circulation at the moment. So. Um, yeah catching up in the chat explorer 2 has a giant case and the watch now explorer 2 is a biggie it is a big watch on the wrist it sure is so not for everyone um it was one of the first modern rolexes that i tried on a couple of years back actually big piece especially the white dial so navy blue fantastic great arrangement and as for the the entire layout pretty stunning the text is a little bit heavy now, between the, the standard and the GMT, I think the GMT is the one that definitely definitely covers it nicely. Gold text is well done. The, fr the fact that they framed the date window and all of that too is good. And it was a watch that had quite a lot of talk around it when it came out. Now, Kevin says he prefers the Tudor MN. For sure. I mean, these are completely different categories side by side. I'm wondering if the colors are identical. I'm sure the Marine National collectors out there would go after both of these watches and it would be nice to see just how the blues pair up side by side uh, the gmt is sold out on their site oh the 300 is not andreas thanks for that i didn't know these were limited editions and i think there's a mention from daniel saying never heard of the yammer before but this is so nice yammer amazing pieces have a look yammer has one of those awesome histories again tied to marine national the, the french navy especially um they're superman 
was the watch that truly defined them through the 60s-ish time, the, the skin diver cases and all that stuff. And the Superman, funny enough, was a dive watch, but ended up becoming a pilot's watch because they just found it more practical. So a lot of the, the armed forces, the pilots for the French Navy, they wore the Superman flying jets, which is great. Uh, I like this Yama bracelet. Yeah, good stuff. It's a good piece. And we're talking in the thousand, I think about a thousand thousand dollars ish zone so pretty nice another brand that's that's resurged made a resurgence should i say and also made in france i mean we get so many new french micro brands and and reissues and watches that are being brought back from from the grave so fantastic it really is nice uh what is the power reserve good question let's have a look um century, 42 hours that was well timed from from lmac 42 hour power reserve 39 mil diameter 12 and a half millimeter height i mean it just it ticks the boxes it really does tick the boxes so cool piece i think uh, what i wanted to do sadly the um the mn tudor didn't line up with this but i wanted to have them side by side to mention the two best of the marine national partnerships of the year have the original reissues like this uh yeah however tried a significant have a tied to a significant memory so i'm out on this iteration understand that mezzanine it's cool not so obvious watches welcome welcome the vast majority of people who watch youtube have upwards of five watches why would anyone want an everyday watch i know right i know i know it's, it's a difficult thing that's true by the way it would be good to just chat about that whole point of how many watches do you have in a collection and what what do you classify as a collection for you some people who have three watches i mean i know a couple that have about four and they're happy with that as a set they don't go beyond it yeah another marine national collaboration which i thought was great to pair up next in the list let's see what else is going on ah this was an email sent in i've had this recommended to me a couple of times and it's definitely one that's been on my radar a lot over the course of this year <clears throat> now serica made a name for themselves as a you know a collaboration of basically taking geez same image Check the white tile. Taking field watches and modifying them to make this this hybrid of field and sports altogether. Serica then decided the next step was to go down the dive watch route. And here we go. Now they can't sell these watches fast enough at the moment. And as as a design goes, I find it really interesting when you look at all the little little details. <clears throat> what do you prefer, white dial or black dial? Should we say? Should we have a vote? B for black dial, W for white dial. Go for it. What do you think? I think for me, I'm going to go. I'll start the voting. <clears throat> I'm quite enjoying the, the whole panda arrangement. It's not the most ideal thing for a dive watch, but there's, there's something about it that's, you know, it adds to the quirk factor. Lots of white dials I'm seeing. Oh, divided, but only on number three. I don't know. Uh, missing you in the chats now. Oh, here we go. There's some comments going on too. Scarface movie poster vibe. <laughs> What's happening? Uh, so, so this is, yeah. So what they've tried to do, you can see a couple of, of influences here. They've looked to the skin diver very much. You've got, I mean, Nevada Grenchen, story for another time. I'm going to be reviewing one of those very soon. Nevada Grenchen and those old school skin divers with the you know, Speedmaster had a similar arrangement at the 12. This is quite true to how skin divers were through the 60s. Next to that, you have a broad arrow hand, which is something that was around the 50s, also brought back around the 60s. You've got these liar lugs, which are so true to <clears throat> Omegas and many other models from the 40s and onwards. And, whoa, this is trippy getting these so big. All in all, huge crown. I think the proportions are good. I believe this is like 39 mils in size. Love the female end link, the fact that it articulates <clears throat> and the strap works nicely. A bit of P01, that's a good shot there from Vmarsh. I want the crown to be bigger. It's not big enough, is it? Um, nose and eyes at the 12. I don't know. I mean, we, we criticize the, um, the phallic arrangement that this represents a lot of the time when we discuss like speedies and all of those, but it's one of those quirks. Again, another thing to mention. I think they pulled a lot of inspiration from, from mid-60s skin divers because this bezel, being both a GMT bezel and a dive bezel, is something that we saw a lot of back then. So you can see there's this great blend. It's, for, for a design person, you see all these funny things like 
you know, the mesh bracelet was something more on, you know, the, the late 60s and 70s. Then you have 50s inspired hands, but then you have 60s bezel, uh, a more 60s case to it too. There's a lot going on. And that could be a, a downside to the watch is that it may be too busy, too technical. Um, yeah, 50s nuclear symbology vibe. I like that. Not so obvious. Uh, yeah, good looking watch. Just a, just a strange one that I think is a nice amalgamation of parts. It's not following a generic route. It's a really odd combo. Yeah. And this is the kind of watch that interests me because you know my favorite watches are the ones I look at and go, huh, what did they do here? You know? phallic arrangement yeah rick sorry about that it's it's a confused mess it is busy like <clears throat> if i had to critique it uh the whole the the numbers so i say the the dots that have been pushed into the dial like this it's a it's a funny thing if they extended that hour hand or maybe just push the dots to the back there's lots of modifications we could do i guess to manipulate it but it's one of a kind and yeah again serica has done some these watches, as they are now, they you can't get hold of them. They have waiting lists, and they're quite backed up. <laughs> it's confusing, though. It is pretty damn confusing. These French spend a lot of time looking at their watches. I mean, yeah, this was this was a part of a collaboration. I think William Brown Project. I think Waco also had a, a part in the process, and in result, really interesting. I'd love to like experience this, getting this on the wrist for a while, being able to see how it wears and how it integrates as a daily dive watch just good stuff like a ceramic bezel and nice finishing it's not your typical day-to-day -day. planetary dot dial that's something else yeah great value for money darth vader's lost space watch i mean right it's got all that so interesting piece i think worth sharing because it's also one of the most successful we can call it a micro brand but it's getting beyond that now one of the most successful releases this year from from them and the dive watch, I think it had a bit of a delayed production, but now that it is being produced, they can't sell fast enough. Um, worth discussing. Next up, what do we have? Oh God, I feel like high horology is up next. Oh, geez. Right, so this is the little Lungo One. Oh my gosh, this thing is beautiful. This is beautiful. Now, next, please tell me there's some real images next to this. I've, I hope they actually did publish some real photos with it all. Time and Tide. Right. Oh, the price on the Serica, I believe it's about $800-ish, round about there, if, if I'm not wrong. Please tell me there's some good image. This is okay. Right. So there were lots of longer releases over the course of this year. There were tons, tons of, of them. Uh, they had some one-off pieces, 1815. Did they bring out the honey gold this year? I think they did. I think they did bring out that 1815 honey gold. This watch is just beautiful. As oh, bloody subscribe stuff. Hold on a sec. Hold on. This watch is insane. As far as a longer one goes, the the fact that they've even added like stars around the dial, it's giving you this whole vibe. So in a nutshell, Moonphase, it's using this gold fleck finish to it. Being the little longer one, it's actually funny enough supposed to be designed for ladies. It's thirty seven millimeters in size, so it's pretty small. Actually, I would imagine this watch would wear smaller than you think on the wrist. Um, I think I think what Lunga has nailed is that 39 mil case. It's beautiful. I don't know if you've been able to try a Lunga in the past, but the 39 mil cases that are like the standard are insanely good. The so 37 mil could be quite small for this arrangement, but I guess you're getting this piece just for the sheer beauty that is the combination. Even the even the damn strap has flex in it. I didn't even notice that. How cool is that? Um, yeah, blue on blue. I guess blue is the talking point once again as far as the color goes, but I think they just nailed it in the sense that it's artisanal and it's subtle and it's got that elegance to it. It's got a bit of old world, like 1950s feel. We saw star motifs used a lot in 50s watches back then. Uh, <laughs> so Nev says, I don't care, I would wear it. I mean, yeah, who wouldn't wear one of these? It's, it's really, really amazing. Pretty fancy, pretty fancy. I now this is the interesting thing with uh, Will. I don't know if this is an aventurine dial or if it's a gold fleck dial. I would imagine. I mean, it looks it looks like aventurine. Uh, Seventy two hour power reserve. I mean, the movements are incredible. Here's some live shots. I think this might have been taken during the launch. Just so good. Of course, they got a diamond set bezel because why not? <laughs> blue on blue, nice song. Ah, uh, yeah, nice watch. 
And I think I think while we're on Lunga, let's actually let's actually go back and have a look at what Lunga released this year in 2021. Because they did some good stuff. They did Salmon Dials. What? I'm not not Jessica Lang. Uh, Lunga and oh geez, hold on a sec. That's, you're so case specific with your words you use, huh? Uh, watch time. This I don't even know where to start. I mean, the Honey Golds were a big deal. I think this was this year. It's been a strange year, like another one of those years that has just flown away. That you can't keep track of. Uh, 1815 honey golds, Russell. If you're still with us, um, yeah, he got he got one, a really nice one. Um, Jessica Lang, <laughs> pretty funny, right, Neff? You love it, eh? Triple splits. They did they did tons. I mean, they did a triple split in blue, I think, with the also honey gold, which was crazy. Um, just the standard little 18 1815 honey gold, no running seconds, was beautiful. This this was an awesome combination of components too. Where do you even start? Oh, geez, we've got interviews and everything. A good year for Lunga, let's say that much. And it's you know pushing, not only pushing the change of materials and colors, but also pushing watchmaking. And that, that's just it. Blue, blue and black, Johnny Lang. Oh my god. I'm taking some more, some more whiskey in. Does it come with a diamond bezel? I believe there are some variants. There's probably a handful that have been equipped. Remember, it's supposed to be a lady's watch. I, I can't understand why this piece isn't considered unisex because it is just beautiful, beautiful, beautiful machine. Interested to meet in person. I don't know what all of this is about. This 1815 Honey Gold was another example. Oh, just insanity. Such such a good finish. As far as a piece that's, that sums up Lunga and their approach, um, simple little 18, 1815 line is one of my favorites too. I should also mention that. Uh, the Arabic numerals on the dial get me every single time. Um, nothing wrong with Jessica Lang. <laughs> Excellent catalog. Uh, I've never seen watches which epitomize elegance, charm, technological advances longer. Yeah, I guess. And the one thing we could say, they, they are amazing watches uh, across the board. One thing we could say is that once you get a longer, they can, in a way, their designs can get a little bit repetitive, if that makes sense. S the Saxony approach to how they design their watches, they do all share a, a very near to identical language, same as Rolex and other manufacturers out there. At times, it can get a bit repetitive seeing you know, the same handset used, the same typeface, just different colors. But I mean, look, you're dealing with such, I mean, geez, look at this thing. This is the Durograph, I think. I can't remember the name, but it's a Tourbillon and a full-on split seconds and it's a perpetual calendar. All fairly reasonable. The only only issue is it's a little bit too big. Yeah, it's just it's just so good, just so good. <laughs> I don't have enough cat tattoos. Uh, Lunga are beautiful, but they leave me a bit cold. Yeah, I mean, like, I th I think it has to do with things like the case designs, a bit pocket watch inspired. But they do have some hidden gems, and you don't necessarily have to look at the modern catalog to find enjoyment. The the older generations of them. Beautiful. First Lunger I got on was a, a datagraph from the 90s. I think it was a platinum datagraph. Oof, what a watch. What a watch. Doesn't stop. And of course, these watches ain't cheap. We are not talking about just, you know, 50 bucks here and there. This is, <laughs> this is quite a mouthful to take in. They are a touch thick. Yeah, that's something else. So, I mean, the, the journey through Lunger. Look how many tabs I've opened. They brought out salmon dials. Of course, they did this one-off piece for the uh, the Tour de Concourse. I think Concourse de Elegance. Full car event. I think someone who brought in a Ferrari won this. And it's in stainless steel, I'm trying to remember. And it's got this beautiful Hunter case back. One of the best. One of the best watches out there. Only one owner. That's going to be so collectible. Salmon dial. Beautiful. I mean, yeah, it just gets it just gets further and further in another rabbit hole you fall down. Fifty bucks. <laughs> uh, this is Bauhaus on your wrist. I, I wouldn't say so. No, no. This is digging further back into traditional watchmaking. Lunga has always been very close to watch watches of. We're talking late eighteen hundreds. You know, eighteen hundreds, seventeen hundreds. Not so much the Bauhaus space. A bar house is a lot more free flowing, more minimal. Look to a brand like Nomos if you want that kind of stuff. I think and the salmon is awesome. Where do you stop? Here's the. I think this is the triple split we were talking about. Well, no, this is the honey gold. Just, I mean, another rabbit hole. Beautiful watches. Lunga, you killed it like every year. I mean, what else can we say? Louis Erard. 
Alain Silberstein, another goodie. Let's see if I can try and get this right. Louis Erard, watch. Uh, hold on, hold on. This Alan Silberstein. Now, these watches came out as a trilogy. And if we're talking about Bauhaus, this works out perfectly. Great question there. Now we're getting into Bauhaus design. Purely as a piece of art, an art form, well worth looking into these. Um, I th they've all been sold out by now, I'm pretty sure. These were limited edition runs. But very art, very creative, worth discussing. Junior, thank you so much for the super chat. God bless everyone. Merry Christmas. Of course, <laughs> I didn't even mention that. The show's been running now for, what, two and a half hours almost. I haven't even mentioned Christmas is like a week away. And it's going to be one of those times where uh, you know, family getting together again. And hopefully everyone stays safe and looks after themselves with all this news going on in the world at the moment. As it has been for the last two years, I think we're all getting pretty sick and tired of it. But this is Bauhaus, as as E M Kui says, QA. This is the epitome of Bauhaus design right here. Whimsical, yes, very whimsical. Smiley faces and triangles, and this is exactly how watches would have been addressed in the Bauhaus school back in the day, which I find amazing. Just the colors alone. This is the way you can like clearly clearly notice it. The colors are what pretty much define the Bauhaus movement. Next would be green, just a green hand next to it, like a forest green. But that's the arrangement. I mean, what they did in this three set was a regulator, a day date. <clears throat> As the week goes by, so the smiley face gets broader and broader, which was funny. And uh, what was the last one? I think a chronograph, a mono pusher chronograph. And they did. There's a gray dial. There's a gray version that looks so good. Let's see if I can find it. If there's a shot. Uh, now, question, ladies and gentlemen, which do you think was better? If I can find it, you said Singapore. I need to look that up. I might as well just type it in. Let's see if we can find it. I don't know what they actually named the selection as. Oh, Google, not helping me. Another rare and attractive limited edition series. Mm, you're not getting it today. Oh, well. Well, we can stick to a watch that helped to find it all there. You can wear it once a year, <laughs> kid birthday, unless you employ it in a club. <laughs> yeah, I mean, look, Bauhaus design, of course, when we look to, to Louis Erard regulators generally, this also came out this year, which was beautiful. Um, there he is. When we look to the watches, and I mean, the colors and everything just fit the, the alignment perfectly. When we look to Bauhaus design, it has this whimsical quality. Amazingly enough, uh, this was this was pretty much brought around during the 20s and 30s, but it's still a design and style that is timeless today. It's still one of those things that you can instantly recognize as Bauhaus design. And yeah, for the, I would totally rock one of these. These are just great. Good fun. And on cheap, Marmite, as Rick says, for sure. Marmite or vanilla or licorice, wherever you are in the world, it's a 50-50. It's a, uh, a designer will always enjoy one of these watches, though, I think. It's one of those... It's It's... Whenever someone stops and asks you about your watch and you can say, this is a Bauhaus design, then all of a sudden you've, you've <laughs> uh, I thought watches like Junghans. Yes, Junghans is very Bauhaus design too. Um, I love these watches. Really add something unlike anything else to the collection. That's just it. Not so obvious. Sorry, Pete. I should call you that. Um, it's just different, complete difference to a collection and a spot of color, vibrance we're seeing again, not your typical standard generic finishes. Thomason, thank you. So thank you so much. The crown isn't very grabbable. Good point. <laughs> Vegemite is better. Oh, God. Uh, Thomason, thank you. I've loved sharing your Milgasses this year. It's been so good. I see Justin EDC joining. Welcome, sir. Let's see if I can find the chronograph. The mono pusher was great. Here it is. So similar but different. As a trilogy set, maybe they'll show us. Also just dig how they've done the, the lugs here where it's articulating. Where the strap is, yes, it's a nylon strap, so it's not it's not like super high end. This is probably Monday, Monday's face for the date, which is pretty hilarious. Do they have all three of them together somewhere to look at? Mono pusher chronographs are just great. Yeah, talking about design art school, St. Peter says that's a very design art school. Miles and yeah, yeah, sorry, Mies and Kandinsky, that's it. Matt Dial. I mean, it's great. It's a really great little piece. Not for everyone, but if you want to know Bauhaus design, this is this is it in the nutshell. Um, go, good white watches this year must have been under the radar, it seems. Yeah, the gray dial. I, I can't find them, but they did a gray series of these two. Gray dial, gray strap, and looks even better than this. The the blue really jumps completely. No, my pleasure. My pleasure, Thomason. Really, it's, it's been a fun year. 
want to carry on into next year with Rishad Week again and, and keep it going. Uh, okay, I'm going to carry on. Dig this watch. Also, fantastic release. Thought provoking. Now, this one, <clears throat> this one, surprisingly enough, wasn't. Oh man, what a cool, what a cool launch. There's been so much talk around the industry around the um, the A three eight fours, the A three eight fives, the of course the what's the other one that Chrono Chrono Master Sport, right? Chrono Master Sport was a big big deal. I'm looking at. I'm um, uh, should I get into this? Can I get into this? Luposity. I need to close some of these tabs. This is insane. Hold on a sec. I need. <laughs> what am I going to do? How many different watches do we have on show here? I think the Black Dial is good enough. Ooh, another good one. No, I'll get into another page and see if I can find something a bit easier for us to digest. Swiss Watches Magazine. So, yeah, as I was saying, <clears throat> lots of talk around the Chronomaster Sport that was a huge deal. Also, a GPHG winner, great talking point. This uses the same movement as the Chronomaster Sport, the, uh, the 36,000 high beat, tenth of a second uh, arrangement. But the, and of course, the A384s, the A385s, the original El Primeros, but not much talk has gone into just the true icon, the A386. And this was a range of watches they brought out to basically not only pay tribute to the A386 in a more true to form way, not only looking to the way the dial's been arranged, but also highlighting the new caliber that's in these watches. Uh, Chrono Master Sport or Daytona Biter, yeah, right. So uh, uh, that that whole thing, oh, that was that was like January, February's news. We we're going mad with that. Um, these are stunning, such good looking watches. And as far as a Zenith Lover, I think this 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 black and white arrangement is so good. So let's have a look at some shots on the wrist. Here is your standard arrangement, of course, coming on a bracelet too. I mean, this or the Chrono Master original, which would you go for? I, I find it extremely industry. I'm, I'm really surprised that it hasn't been spoken about. I did a video about this piece trying to talk about the design influences and all those elements. The Chrono Master Sport Yoshida edition. Is that another one? Check directly on Yoshida website. So thank you for that, WJA. I always feel a little strange when I see overlapping subdials, but Zenith top notch. This is a thing. I mean, when done wrong, you can't actually read the subdials properly. They have... They have done that before uh, with some of their pieces, but they've improved on that now. You can see that the subdials overlapping. You can, in fact, read them. But what's just so good is that this is instantly recognizable as Zenith. Uh, Kevin, I think I think it is a 38. It's a 38 or a 39. They nailed the proportions on this thing. Look at that. If I had all the money in the world, I'd be getting one of these tomorrow. Honestly, the faux loom, I don't know why they went this way. I don't know if it was needed, if it was necessary. But that reverse panda dial just looks insane. And it's all Zenith. One of the best releases of the year for me, personally. Just in line with, with the Moza Pioneer and the and the, three, the 3861 Omega. This is another example of a watch that I think has capped off this year very well. And surprisingly, again, hasn't been spoken about very much. I wonder why. Because you're getting all in-house watchmaking. <laughs> You're getting an entirely new caliber, ridiculous movements. I mean, a tenth of a second, it's it's nuts. Uh, so this is called the Chrono Master Original, if you, if you want to double check, if you're interested in looking at it. They're not cheap watches. They're using the new caliber. So of course, the value, the, the price is going up. But I mean, I'm a sucker for Daytona looks. So got to be the Chrono Master Sport. Yeah, we can chat about the Chrono Master Sport, I guess, since we're on it. Might as well. We can compare them side by side. I mean, it's everywhere. You don't even have to like, look very far <laughs> uh, amazing the splash this thing made when it came out right everyone i mean it was just it was just this thing my rationale around it is that they were sticking to i believe the zenith elite and other references they weren't necessarily going down the the daytona rabbit hole here we go here's the examples this is how it evolved over time I also remember that this is not a new movement. This movement has been used in all of these anniversary editions already. Uh, the rainbow, lots of little influences that went into it. But of course, this was criticized for one reason. Uh, you can see you can, you can see obvious similarities linked to it. But, you know, what can you do? I love the schematic, by the way. This looks very professional. Okay, hitting the coffee. The Zenith overlap subdials is so their design language. Yeah, right. And they were getting criticized. I mean, the whole the whole concept that the overlap doesn't work very well. 
if you want to define Zenith, it's huge subdials that overlap one another. It's the date at the 430 position. It's the star at the top of the dial. It's the beautiful script that they always use. And I think what's made the original just so much nicer is you have the scale, the actual tachymeter scale inside the glass. And just the contrast in colors, it, it adjusts the presence of the watch on the wrist too very nicely. If you've handled vintage Daytonas, you know that that like plays with the, the overall size of it on the wrist. Yeah, it's a goodie. It's a real goodie. I think the colors just nailed it. Chronomaster Sports. Yeah, that was this was like January, January back in the day. Uh, Zenith was always more about movements. Yeah, always for sure. I mean, that's that was their competition. They they won the bid at the end of the day. It's pretty good. Um, all things going. Yeah, going to carry on through. I think we've chatted about Zenith enough and the Chronomaster original. What what an amazing piece. Super impressed with what they did. Next up, oh, and one more wash. Hold on. Before we get out of here, I really hope to have the, the boutique edition. I mean, look how good that is. Watch this. We want to talk about rare and attractive special models. Chronomaster original boutique. This, this watch came out of nowhere. This wasn't even highlighted. Oh. Oh, this is good. Now, as far as I know, when this watch was launched as a as a set of, of three pieces, basically, precious metal, a white dial, and a black dial, they failed to mention the, the boutique only edition, which was blue. And that is just so gorgeous. So good. Again, we're going to blue watches. I don't know why this is like the theme, but oof, it's pretty. It's so, so pretty. So yeah, I mean, if you want a blue dial Zenith, go check out the boutique edition, one of these models. I, they're probably not around anymore, but Funny with the Chronomaster Sport. Compare the Black Daytona, Black Zenith, and they are fundamentally different, completely different watches. You're right. Movement. I mean, the only things they have in common is like the ceramic bezel. Case proportions are relatively the same, but movement-wise, completely different animals. And I love the fact that, I mean, Zenith supplied movements to these companies for years, for decades. Something else that brands fail to realize is that the El Primero movement <laughs> was like the running movement for... 30 years for most brands before they decided to go in-house and make their own stuff. Love it. How good is that blue? Real real hidden gem. Another example, just stunning watch release of the year. Okay, next up, Glasuta CQ. I don't know why I chose this watch, but I loved, I think I just love the green. Now, going into green watches, this was big talk over the course of this year. Will it let me into revolution? This was featured most recently um, on the last watch report show that we did, it's it's a goodie. It's a goodie. I think as far as a green watch goes, when it's olive drab and it's finished nicely and it's ceramic bezel and awesome story behind the movement too, Neff, yeah, I agree. It's it's a legend. I mean, it's as good as the 321 from Omega and the 1861. And, and it, Zenith should be a Daytona's Daytona watchmaker. Yeah, they should like have that as like a banner, you know? Yeah, so as far as the, uh-oh, uh-oh, Magic Mouse. Oh no, I clicked something. I, I This is a great looking, I don't know if Kelsowitz is still with us, but he um, he picked up one of these watches a couple of years back. And the fact that they brought this out in green, such a good color for this watch, I think. That's the main reason why I liked it. This was a tasteful use of green as a color arrangement. Um, has a really great case design. Yeah, you're telling me. Skin diver cases. Who mentioned that? That was from Instablane. Skin diver cases, um, RS65, all of those models around there, thin in profile. You, it's, it's amazing. The skin diver case, the huge advantage that it had was just that flat profile on the wrist, something that you don't see very often. Um, Hunter Green or British Racing Green, Lord of Lord of Fleck, Lord of Leck, sorry. Um, I would, I don't know what I would look at that loom. I don't know what I would call it. It's difficult when you're looking through renders and it's very difficult to judge it. I would say more along the lines of a forest green, not a racing green. Racing green has a bit more teal in it, you know? Oh, it's good. So Nef doesn't, Neferon doesn't like this, and he loves green. Why don't you like this, Neferon? Is it, is it the typeface and the arrangement, or is it just it's just a green? Moss green is a pretty good call. Spinach green. Yeah. So as far as, um, <clears throat> as far as this brand goes, I think this one has definitely piqued my interest quite a bit. No, no faux loom on the dial or anything. Kept it basic. Looks pretty modern. Of the CQ, adore the big date. Yeah, the, the 43 mil big dates, Pete, those are goodies. Those are good pieces. Don't bother about them. That uh, guy's chatting once as well. Um, it's the watch, not the green. Ah, got you, got you. 
they're also hellishly expensive, which is a downside. Um, being being bespoke, being made in Glasuta, and they can they can ask for high prices. Of course, all being made in house is pretty nice. Really expensive, six two MAS. Yeah, that's it. Is that dial green? Just <laughs> color blindness. Yeah, it's, it's difficult. Some lights it looks dark and like black nearly. Yeah, good looking piece. I think this this one captivated me for the color more than anything. I like the arrangements. It's when a color blends quite nicely in with the the overall composition of a watch. Uh, yeah, forty three mils a goodie. The offset date is a very nice thing that I think Lasuta has nailed. What else do we have? Um, next up on the list. All right, I'm going to need some help in the chat if I can't remember this. It's the Zen 103. Uh, let's see, Zen 103 Classic 12. Okay, now this one was a piece that I did not realize came out, but this is what we could consider a reissue from the brand in many ways. Let's see if I can find a good image. Fratello discusses it. Zen, Zen did some good things this year too. They've also been ones to play around with materials a lot over the course of this year. Um, but this piece is a reissue of a classic model, and this is an example of, oh, look at this, 1960s, the 103B. You know, German pilot watches where, I mean, you can't you can't fault them. They are just, just insane. Hitting the whiskey again. James says, I've fallen out of love with the CQ. Yeah, not not just the price, but the, the overall aesthetic. I can I can understand that it divides opinion. Similar to the RS65 that I have. Skin divers were hit or miss back then, you know. First ceramic bezel from Zen. I don't know, Kevin. There's someone in the Instablane. You're wearing this watch right now. Instablane, share what, what you can about this piece because I would love to know. This was mentioned in, I think it was actually your comment that I've pulled as a reference to talk about this piece. Oh, man, where's the side-by-side? -side? Hold on. There was a better article that I found about this piece. I've got to close some of these tabs. This is insane. Hold on a sec. Jeepers. I've just been opening up tabs time and time. Um, I think it was a monochrome article, or maybe it was Zinn themselves. Time and Tide, I think, covered it. Maybe. Let's hope. Here we go. It was Time and Tide. So like, like so many other reissues we've been seeing, this is an example of a watch. Hold on a sec. If I can find the side-by-side -side imagery. Wow, that's very pixelated, but you get you get the rough idea. Seven, I think it does have a 7750. I would like to know. Just as much as you can share, Instablane, that'd be good to know. So on the left hand, right hand side, we have the modern. On the left hand side, we have the vintage. And it's just this this blend of parts. These aren't these are limited editions. Uh, the dial and the bezel is another level for Zinn. Uh, it's thick, but wears fine. Domed crystal for both sides. Uh, more like a 15 mil glossy dial. Very interesting. Yep. 600 May, Thomas says, Thomas says. Sold out in just two days. Jubilee edition to celebrate 60 years of Zinn. Really cool. These are going to be sought after, eh? very sought after. The one gripe I have, but I know this is what all Zen pilot watches do nowadays, is these crown guards. They're good. I mean, they integrate very nicely, but I do prefer a, a pilot without crown guards. That's that's all. That's like my one criticism. Needle hands, everything. Excuse me. Syringe hands and everything work well. The GMT bezel is also fantastic. I like that they've actually added Frankfurt and everything on the dial. Another cool old school based style. Salita based 7750 and says, yeah, applied indices, needle hands, 12 hour. Really nice. My computer is old. Also, is 350 tabs enough? I don't know what I should do here. I need to close some of these things. Bear with me for a moment as I get rid of some of these. There's tons going on. <laughs> I, I'm actually surprised the computer's still going, you know? Yeah, I do abuse this thing, as you can see. I like the screw down. This has a screw down crown. Oh, of course, screw down pushes too. Fantastic. Yeah, you can see where they've actually modified it. You know, you don't just have pump pushes anymore. This this watch can be actually used in water and everything. Yeah, good piece. Really good piece. I thought this was quite exciting. It's nice to see a reissue. And of course, we've seen so many Zins in partnership with, with Monochrome and the Rake, where they're celebrating Bundeswehrs and 3H Hoyer models and all the rest. I think it's like 16 millimeters, Andreas. Most of Zinn's 15 to 17 watt. Yeah, this is from James talking about sizes. Um, everyone can, everything can be sold with 32 gigs of RAM, right? I don't know how many. I'm pretty sure. I'm, I'm almost certain that this one, I, I top spec this thing out. It was hell expensive. I think it has like 64 gigs of RAM. So we, we're okay. I think we'll be okay. Um, 
Frankfurt am Main written on the dial to celebrate the financial district of Germany. Thomas, thank you for that. <laughs> Don't worry, it won't crash. Computer's good. I mean, I, I have full faith. The only thing that might crash will be the Wi-Fi. Touch wood. But otherwise, I think we'll be okay. Uh, Pilot's chrono with screw-down pushes seems a bit silly. I mean, chronographs with screw-down pushes is silly, right? I mean, that's just like the thing. When, when you're dealing with something that needs to be operated on the fly. But then again, I mean... More often than not, when you're using these watches, this is my rationale, when you're talking about a pilot's piece, you're using it as a uh, mission timer. So you're setting it, you're just letting it run. You're, you're pushing the pusher, you're letting it go for six, seven hours, depending on how long the mission lasts or the, the process. Of course, Pete, you're in the, the Air Force, so you know a lot more about this than me. But being able to just set it and use it as your running timer as the mission goes, whether it's an hour or two hours, that way, having the pushes out of the way, everything closed up, so you don't need to stop and reset. Nothing will, you know, get in the way of gloves and all of that is something. At least that's what I use my my aviation chrono for. I love I love tri compact arrangements, <clears throat> and the, and the idea that you can just set it and let it run for nine hours and then use that as your as your timer over the course of the day. Yeah, goody. Do you like the Blanc Pond Fifty Fathoms? Yes, Al Mac. It was one of the first watches that was actually featured at the beginning of the show. The, uh, the No Rads was one of my favorite watch releases of this year that they did. Okay, I'm going to move on next. This is a great little piece. Glad we were able to highlight Zinn. And I see Carl joining in. Welcome, Carl. Really good. I didn't think there was going to be another one this year. <laughs> I wanted to do it I wanted to do it next weekend, but you know, it's the 25th next weekend, so it's a bit of a problem. You can't, you can't exactly squeeze it in on Christmas Day. Yeah, okay, next up. Oh, jeez, oh, this thing. This thing was good. Right, where do you even start with this watch? Um, this was a piece that we covered again, uh, Watch Report Q3, a couple of months back. And this being the recreation of the Everest models given to Corey Richards, now full chronograph. I believe these are like boutique-only pieces. They're pretty hard to get your hands on, but so good. So, so good. VC is very cool. So this, I believe these are titanium as well. As far as a dual time goes, I think they have nailed it. This is the in reincarnation of the 1655 from, from Vacheron. It's such a good explorer's instrument. And I love how they ride this line of being super formal with the way they address the sports dress watch. But then at the same time, they can incorporate this kind of material and make it look functional and busy it's you know orange accents and all of that so this was the original model the one off this will be expensive yeah hella expensive i don't even want to know the chronograph uh, i think this is what was brought up the last show we did the chronograph looks so generic next to the dual time which i find pretty hilarious don't like the photo on the left mm. on wrist it looks sick oh really okay i'm gonna get i'm gonna get through to it this yeah this watch especially in the render it looks pretty generic i think because everything is so balanced, everything is so symmetrical next to the dual time, which has you know, the GMT, the AM, PM indicator. It's just fun. It's so good. Look at them side by side. There's the one and there's the other. I think the dual time is the one that wins the day. It's really nice. And just getting through to the details on this piece, this is again is the one off model. Just some good stuff. I think this is the latest edition. The chronograph it looks good. It does look good, but all in all, um, it's a bit safe. And you can't say safe. <laughs> you can't say safe when you're looking to Vacheron as a piece. Uh, the dual time is just just stunning. Christmas shopping, not so obvious. Great to have you here, Pete. Really great to have you here. I love watching your shows. I love watching your clips. You have such great insights. I love that you add a different dynamic to the conversation around pieces we pick up. Really a pleasure having you here, Pete. Um, yeah. Awesome arrangement, but I think the dual time still wins, though the chronograph is nice. Uh, the matte dial form, I don't know. I don't know what it is. You can't say that, the, yeah, dual time is way better. It's a funny thing, right? Maybe it's just because our eyes aren't so drawn to the symmetry. It's just too repetitive. Vatican sporty, I like that, Forbin, where, where the, the dual time offers that diversity. It's still good, though. It's still very good pieces, but look at that thing. Amazing. One of the best releases from Vacheron. I also did have the Excellence Platine. It was a huge, long name. Gorgeous chronograph. I think we should pull it up just for fun since we're at it. How long has the show been going on for? Nearly three hours. 
Goodness. Um, Vacheron Excellence Platine, I think it's called. Yep, here it is. I can find the chronograph, and we can pull up the full name. This this was hilarious, uh, Chrono. I hope they still have it. I see Shy Town's joining us. Welcome, Shy Town. Good to have you here, as always. So, feels like Knight of Malta wearing this. Yeah, right, right. Let's have a discussion around this, just very briefly. It's just uh, if I can find the name of this watch is worth the ticket price alone. <clears throat> Are you ready? Vacheron Constantin, traditional split seconds chronograph, ultra thin collection, excellence, platine. The main reason why I didn't feature this watch is because when you put this in the timestamp, which will be after the show in the comments, it takes up the full length of the timestamp because it's just the most, <laughs> it's the most ridiculous name I've ever heard in my life. Uh, but it's just so good. Mono Pusher, Rattrapant, I believe. A beautiful chronograph, beautiful arrangement. So of of the fashion on all the words <laughs> of the watches released this year from VC, I think these are the ones that take the cake. The dual time and this excellence platine. Let's have a look at this movement. A cut above. There's nothing better than having the rotor on the outer track, out of the way of everything else. Look at this thing. You've got the Maltese cross for the column wheel. <clears throat> Two Maltese crosses because, of course, and you've got more. You've got a third one on the rotor. You've got another one probably on the signature. You've got another one on the <laughs> so many. They're like five Maltese crosses on one side of the watch. Love some mono pushes. Yeah. What's the second crown for in the dual time? Okay, the one crown is for uh setting the time, of course, this big one. The second crown, I believe, is for the inset bezel. I do believe this is a compressor stop. Maybe I'm wrong. No, no, no. I think the one crown is for the AM PM indicator, the dual time component the one at the bottom and the one the main one is used for setting the time and the date correct me if i'm wrong but i think i think that's it and yeah the laughing we have about the vatican and it's just it's, it's i can't believe how many crowd how many crosses there are on this thing that's got to be a record you know and we move to the, the dial is probably even more so these are insane 950 platinum of course 42 mil diameter i mean that's amazing superb watch just out of this world I'm sure if Juan is still watching, he'll be very interested in this piece. Templar's modern watch. That's it. That's it. All other VCs are too pricey for me these days. I mean, yeah, these these ain't cheap, unfortunately. You can't get these for 50 bucks. But moves the GMT hand time. See, Turbo, you would know because you do have an overseas. Okay, carrying on through next to what else do we have? Oh, my God. This is crazy. I mean, I'm very glad I like limited it down to... 30 pieces because this would have taken 20 hours you know oh geez okay let's chat about the Chapek Antarctique Ratchapunt this is a bit of a different edition you're noticing that the render on the left is using a solid red hand and this might have come out this is a later stage I think this one got all the attention I mean it only watched that an amazing example this is this is good it's it's just the one thing I don't really enjoy is I find it a bit too technical. It's a bit too cluttered, similar to the, the JLC in a way, but then the movement is pushed all the way to the front. So I think I think it's a goodie. And that column wheel, nice arrangement in the center. It's nicely balanced. So Chapek is obviously getting a lot of attention, a lot of praise now. You're seeing a lot more interest in the brand. It's still a bit of a delayed fuse at the moment, I think. Can't see time. I mean, it's, yeah, yep, another problem. They tried to blue the hands to make it better. Clearing my throat, hold on. Clearing my throat. <clears throat> I think it is Fisherman's Friends time. Hold on a sec while I pull that out. They did heat blue the hands in a way. You can order the piece with a red rat upon hand. Russell, Russell, I, th I think I'm trying to get Russell down the AP rabbit hole. He refuses to get AP. And I know if you do get one, you'll be addicted to them. So don't do it. I reckon you don't do it. That's very interesting, Russell. Thanks for that. So you can actually choose to get the hand painted or not. Yeah. Downside, I mean, they tried to brighten it up by bluing the hands, which makes makes it more legible to read. Um, but the, the arrangements that the dial itself, Unfortunately, in a way, it is celebrating the watchmaking. It's an entirely new caliber they're using. It's a retropont. It's an extremely thin retropont and all of that too. But the legibility goes out the window. So for a chronograph, do you actually even care? I mean, do you really care that you're losing legibility when you have a piece like this? Uh, it's cool. 
it is really cool. I also enjoy the the offsetting of the subdials, similar to pieces that we see from models like from Lunga and from Patek. Um, yeah, AP Russell, be careful. Once you go down the AP path, there'll be no going back. You'll be selling your Nautiluses, I'm afraid. Yeah, dangerous. The movement at the back, it's good. But you can see what they've done is they've shifted all of the attention to the front, which is also quite nice. Sadly, there's not really much to to see on the back. But I mean, all in all, another just standout launch from this year and worthy of worthy of attention and praise. It's good to see Chapek is now moving up in the echelons. They had a few at watch time NYC and the cases were scratched up pretty bad. Ooh, perhaps with the prototypes being shown. Maybe. I mean, watches being sent out to um to get uh you know tested around the place. You notice that quite often with prototypes that they get scratched up and it's it's weird. Especially when when bloggers and and my, magazines are featuring them and they, they they have to photograph these things that have been used and abused. Rosa looks like look hold the plays logo. Hold on a sec. So what are you saying? That the Nakatomi plays logo, Plaza logo. Very interesting from Neff. I could not catch that point. Very good there. 100% recycle. I don't know what that's about. Is this recycled gold that they've used? There's something printed on the on the rotor there. Anyway, prototype one of five. Of course, for only watch, they had a brass dial, I believe, which stood out very nicely. Um, James saying, really don't like this watch, but I am, I'm, I'm not a huge uh, skeleton guy. Yeah, unless AP or, or GP. Yeah. I think all in all, it's a great moment for for their watchmaking. The fact that they're bringing this kind of complication to the forefront, literally to the <laughs> to the forefront. Uh, but then again, you're losing legibility, and do you? I guess it's a double edged sword because I mean, if you want a, if you want a legible watch, just get the standard Antarctic. There's so many good ones. Um, so this, in a way, was their was their method of trying to get this flagship out for people to have a look at. Uh, yeah, for visibility, Tom is saying the blued hands make a lot of sense for sure. It's all just down to the angle of the wrist. Uh, I just saw one on the on new Bamford. Well, has a collaboration with Flank Mueller to produce a limited production Snoopy Crazy. Oh, geez. Yeah, I mean, Bamford were one of the first on board with Snoopy pieces. My, my old eyes couldn't handle the skeleton dial. Yeah, same issues with Zenith. I can understand that, Kevin. Yeah, so another great launch huge standout of the year one of the best watches of the year i would say in the same kind of league as jlc with that launch they did with the reverso awesome piece god i can't tell you how much that fisherman's friend is saving me at the moment it's amazing okay another this is a subtle one this is not a watch that everyone's been bragging about but i can't even remember the name platinum tourbillon it's a platinum tourbillon okay no, that's not. What the hell is it called? Hold on. 2021. Let's get it properly. I think I should actually just read the description I wrote for it. Uh, hold on a sec if I can find it. Of course, because the images weren't open up, opened up in um, order. Here we go. Extra plat. This was a shout out made during one of the shows, uh, I think third quarter. And this is celebrating the Tourbillon. I mean, it's huge. It's a big deal. This is in line with seeing how the Reverso was redone for its 90th anniversary, this is celebrating what, 100th or 200th? I'll get I'll get to it eventually. Reading the article, celebrating anniversary of the Breguet Tourbillon, which is a bit of a point of contention because there's belief that an English watchmaker actually did the Tourbillon beforehand. But what's so good about this piece is that you can see it's clearly Breguet, and it's not trying to bring attention to itself. It's just doing what it does. The asymmetry works so nicely here, how the dial has been thrown to the top left, huge open space around the base. Even the tourbillon is offset, and it's just that subtlety around it that, that sums it up so nicely. Shaitan saying, what watch am I wearing? The, the Seamaster 57. That's like my weekend watch now. I, I tend to only wear it over the weekends just to have that special occasion. Also, timekeeping is so good. I can pretty much follow these shows to the second, which is also nice. Yeah, watches blue for eternity. EMCAU. I don't know what that's very interesting. I've never read that before. Classic beauty. It's really stunning. Let's try and get to the details because when you look to the case back, I find this this makes me smile actually. So of course we know Breguet with their pocket watches and the way they've done the cases. That whole uh, coin edging is something that's defined them. Eighteen oh one was the granted ten year patent for patent patent for uh, our man, Mister Breguet. 
And 41 mil case, fluted, blah de blah. We, we know most details about the watch in general. 41 mil case, most of it's pretty simil, similar to what we know. Clou de Paris, um, handmade with a diamond chisel. But this anniversary, what, the cross lines pitch only 0.25 millimeters. We want to get really technical. Um, <clears throat> this doesn't this doesn't shout for your attention, and I think that's good. Barley grain motif. Something that's important to note. <clears throat> the way that this this style was machined, insanely, insanely small elements. Uh, you can't even see at your end. Uh, the quality is like so sharp. You can see tiny little grains. That's how tight the machining has been here. It's like the Vitruvian man here, yeah, right? Like mind-blowing, like pioneering. It's so good. I see 73 Maths joined us again. Welcome. This this is, I love, similar to that AP that we saw, the Platinum Royal Oak earlier on. This is another watch that had such a quiet release. Nothing overblown. Nothing that was even picked up really by the articles. Um, but also just has so many little asterisks this is, this is next to it that, that does something different. Uh, also, I think this is heat blued, but let's try and get to the movement because this is the best part. This is the technical drawing of the original patent for the tourbillon on the back. And that's like so, we call it meta, you know, self-referential. It's a bit on the nose, but I love it. I think it's so cool for the, for the designer, for someone who loves the technical stuff. You have a top, this is a side profile of the tourbillon mounted. And we've got, we've got like cross hatching down there. I think that's the only one that they've used. But I love it. So that's that's the idea. So it's all hand engraved, and you have <laughs> that's that is the celebration from 1801 to 2021. What's that? 220 years. Uh, I'm not going to try and do maths at this time of the night. Here's the original patent drawing. It's just nuts. It's just so crazy. I love this. This is like when it gets so deep into it that most brands most brands don't care that not that that much. But Brigade likes to pay attention to those details. As far as an anniversary watch goes, pretty, pretty good. Um, cross hatch for the, <laughs> like that. Um, yeah, well, no, here's a question. Which watch raises pulse if not this watch? Yeah, I mean, it's subtle. I don't I don't say, I mean, this watch, compared to that, that bloody Tiffany 5711 that we had earlier on, this is the kind of watch that you could wear in a public setting and no one would look at it twice. And it doesn't draw, I think it's such a great polar opposite. This is why I, I liked featuring it. Next to the bright and flamboyant Patek Nautilus that sells for 6.5 million at, at auction. Peripheral rotor, good point there, Neff. I was going to say that. The rotor's on the outside. This is an automatic watch, pure watchmaking prowess right there. Any more good shots of the movement? I hope, is there anything good we can share? Well, here we go. So the rotor is sitting on the outskirts here running on a, on a gear set. So next to the outlandish Tiffany Nautilus that would get everyone's eyes and attention in all the photographs, you're rocking one of these things. It's just a, it's just a brig, eh? You know, it's a, got it for a couple of grand. It's nothing too special until it's, you know, it's the anniversary of the, of the tourbillon, which, okay, it is like the most irrelevant complication, realistically speaking. But you know what? It's cool. This is crazy watchmaking, you know? Um, anyway, carrying on through. I don't know if I should leave this here for a second, get into the comments while I, I miss... Um, Hamilton is doing fine in their niche for a watch. Hamilton's good. Um, never owned a Zenith. I'm missing a lot of crosshatch. Got that part there. This is an auto. Yes, it's an auto. Uh, James says, Chronomaster talking about a Zenith. Thomas, it's funny, Marco, the lugs, is Marco still in the chat? Because, I mean, I'm sure Marco would love this. He could probably talk about this watch for weeks if he's still with us. Um, 164K euros, though. I think it's worth it. Honestly, I think it's worth it for what this watch represents. This is for the diehard. Obviously, it's for the diehard. And if you want to get that far in, mm, uh, getting one of these watches, it's uh, it's amazing. I, I love it for the for the background. That's what really draws a watch to me, I've noticed. That, that FXD from Tudor, I love it because of the Marine National history and the development and the design that's gone into it. Can I explain the blue baton? I can't, 72 Math. I do not know the significance of it. I would love to know if someone else does, if this is just something that they've always done. The, the whole idea behind heat blowing, I know, is just for the sake of legibility. Uh, Breguet and the English watchmakers back in the day used to just heat blue watches because uh, on a white background, you can't have a silver handset. Um, and this is just an artisanal thing that also increases the, the legibility of the hands. So I think 
the blue was done to bring attention, to draw attention to the tourbillon. But that's about it. Blue jewel. Ooh, could be a sapphire. Neff, good point. Um, Russell, you might like to take a jab at that because we were chatting about diamonds on tourbillons a while back. That could easily be a blue sapphire, but we know. If, it, if you look at the articles, I'm sure you'll find it, but that could easily be one. Blue sapphire would be stronger than a ruby, right? Yeah. Jay-Z looked like a tryhard in that picture. Yeah, Kevin, it wasn't it wasn't a good look, but you know what? If you can get it, that's cool. He's an ambassador for the brand. He got the watch for free, so worth discussing. Uh, the, the Bulgari, now, let's check. I can't even type it in now. Uh, Roma. No, it's not the Roma. It's the, it's the GM. Uh, where is it? The World Timer. I'm sure I'll get the same results. No, there's, there's lots of Romas. I think it's called the World Timer. Okay. Let's chat about this for a sec. Now, I have had a few reservations about this watch. Not for corrosion resistance. That's another... Yes, Andreas, that's another good point. Yes, that was also done for that reason. So it not only makes the steel more legible, but also aids in corrosion resistance. Very good point. Something to also slip my mind. It's an amazing thing, the fact that you can just heat blue a material and get it to... Well, just heat, heat it to an extent where it can be a lot more usable as a material. Um, okay. So let's chat about this machine. Now, Bulgari has got so many in the Octo line. So, so many. And they've released everything from a perpetual calendar. This I think it was a perpetual or an annual. They've got everything. They've got chronographs. They've got GMTs. The Octo range is massive. But the, the Roma world time that they brought out, this one definitely caught attention. Now, as far as the reason why I like featuring this is the value proposition, I think is special. This is a, a great watch for what you're getting price-wise, movement-wise. Um, the thing I criticize is the case. I'm not so much of a fan of the Octo style uh, case with a rounded dial, but the dial on this watch is beautiful. And that's something else to capture is one of the best dials I think I've ever seen from Bulgari as a brand. It's so tastefully done, subtle, simplistic. Uh, the reason why I featured the black, you can't see the you can't see the case as much, which is quite nice. It's a little bit more subtle, and I mean the dial is front and center. You can read everything very nicely there. The bracelet does fit the watch. That big gap. So let's see if I can find some more shots or uh -oh, some more shots of it on the wrist. Yeah, it's the lugs. I don't know. The lugs just don't do it for me. I've tried to redesign it, and everyone turned their noses up to it. So whatever. That's just how we. This is how we're gonna do it. Um, I'm more of a fan of the fragrances. Me too, Shaitan. I've actually, I had a sample of one once and pretty awesome. Uh, the Man in Black line. I need to try it. Got to get a new fragrance. Um, 5711, Tiffany again. Yeah, yeah. I'm not going to talk about it again. Don't worry. Um, Roma design is more tasteful than the Octofinissimo to me. I, the dial to me is standout. It's so, so good. <clears throat> Couldn't have been done better, I think. It's, it's right on the money. It's exactly what you want from... I mean, it just captures the way they, they approach their pieces, the language of the typeface that they use, the, the batons, the handset, so neat and tidy. And it doesn't scream for your attention either. It's just a really well-balanced arrangement. But the case, uh, it's just me, just me to say that the case feels a bit chunky and a bit all over the show. Scarab, Scarab Beetle, you know? Um, dial, is, dial is stunning, really is stunning. Uh, Roma World Time, another one of the best releases. Yep, yep, on the hot take with our man, JCB. Oof, the black one's also very nice. Stealth. So a really good piece. And they brought out so many others too. The Perpetual was the one that won the um, the GPHG award, I think. Let's see if I can find it. Because that was also, I love that watch. And also a piece that people turn their noses up to it. Uh, I think Perpetual Calendar. I really, really like this one. This is the, the design person in me looking at it from a rule of thirds and balance and asymmetry and all of that set. This this is cool. I really dig it. It's got a it's got a I mean it's got the full calendar at the base, it's got the the leap year and all of that. Yeah. I'd actually like to I'd actually like to hear from you. Yes or no on the watch on the right. Y or N. Because it's it's something that has divided a lot of opinions. Bear in mind that this was given the GPHG award, which is which is crazy. I did, didn't expect that at all. Um, Manwood Neroli, Summer Scent. Manwood, Chi Town. Is that really a name? Do they really call us fragrance Manwood? <laughs> oh man. Uh, so we get no's, yeses. I'm I'm throwing in my answer for this one on the right. 
I, I dig it. I don't know why I dig it, but I just do. It's a funny. And of course, if you're someone who does have the standard Octo, you probably feel otherwise that this is way too cluttered. I prefer the chronograph. That's beautiful. The GMT is also a goodie. I see quite a few yeses, quite a few noes. I think it's balanced. Balanced out okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I dig it. I dig it. I've got to get a vote going. I've got to have a vote going on. I mean, why not? Yeah, it's not for everyone, but um, I mean, the blue dial also looks great. Cool looking piece. I, I laugh that this actually got the GPHG. Personally, I think the, the world timer has a more beautiful dial, really. Um, Oturo Manstream, man I don't know what I'm reading here. I want to be a yes, but as of now, no. Man would. I can't believe that's a thing, Shaitan. You can really call a fragrance that. I guess you can in today's day and age. That's funny, though. But really, really cool piece. The movement leaves a bit to be desired. Let's be honest here. Why have a display case back for such a simple looking? I don't know why. I don't know why. But the dial is gorgeous. Stand out. One of the best releases this year from Bulgari is that world time dial. I want to see them put that dial into another case and be amazed. Love the retrograde. Okay, we're going to move on next to, I don't know what. I really don't know what else. Uh, I think this is actually the last watch of the show, I believe, if I remember right. The Moser um, dual time... And it's the Burgundy. Uh, Burgess Hill. What? Hold on. Hold on. This was another example of man wood. I, I just, I can't believe that's a thing. That's really a fragrance name. Yeah. So the Heritage Jewel Time Burgundy. Burgundy, I think, is going to be the next color. That's going to be like the hot topic that everyone's going to be going after very soon. I think what wins this watch over for a lot of us is that classic numeral arrangement, the old school wire lugs, dual time dials, very pretty. And I think Moser just can't do wrong with their dials. <laughs> if also the man wood essence shites on I, I can't believe. I've got to look into this because this is funny. I'll just get it for the name. I think that's so like, <laughs> can't get more masculine than that, right? Moser Heritage GMT. Yeah. So, so. Just stunning, standout looking watch. And again, I mean, the Streamliner Perpetual, they did another great year for Moser. They don't seem to ever get wrong. And I think the reason why is because they're always out there with what they do. They never conform to anything conventional. And because of that, constantly pushing directions with colors and just going mad, not, not subscribing to anything typical, it lets them be ahead of the curve a lot of the time. And it ends up being that the watches they release are never boring. They're never repetitive. Yeah. Be talking now about more of oh, bloody fragrances. This gray dial is also beautiful. I mean, this is not, this is not a dual time. I don't think, but just so good. Another pilot inspired chrono, please. Enough man would. It's so bad. Okay. Hitting the, hitting the whiskey again. Zenith type 20 vibes. I mean, this really hits you in the, it's you in the 20s, actually like the 1910s, 20s, 30s, when you had aviators crossing the channel and across the Atlantic for the first time. These are the kinds of watches they would be wearing. And yeah, I mean, it's so old school. It's not for everyone. It's not, it's not a Moser that would probably pull a lot of people in because it does play on, as, as mentioned uh, from Jay, very Zenith Type 20 in the way the dial has been done. Uh, but I think it's where the, the dials step in that, that does add a different dynamic to the arrangement there. Of course, they have a tourbillon like this too. Yeah, it's the smells that will not, yeah, it won't be well received. I don't think so. I think it's a bit a bit too out there. Whereas the Streamliner has been one that people have been picking up on. The Streamliner Perpetual was a big deal this year, and, and so it goes. Prefer three-hander over the dual time, making Gerald Genta proud. <laughs> uh, George says, and I can't understand what they were thinking, uh, the point of the dual time uh, where you still have to think, or worse, I would phone to figure out day or night, such a massive of oversight. Oh, the AM, PM indicator. Yeah, that's something. Huh? That is something. You must also remember, though, that Moser has has the forefront in their, their catalog and their DNA is restraint. It's limiting it down to like the most basic of elements. Their chronographs, I mean, that, that streamliner chrono is such a good example of that, where you don't have any subdials. It's all just hands. And yeah, love it or hate it. They don't even, I mean, the Moser script isn't even painted on the dial. I don't know why they did that. Maybe just for the sake of legibility and all of that there too. Um, yeah, I was underwhelmed with the Moser Green Dragon when I saw it in person. Not sure. Yeah, 
it's i mean the, the funky blue that that one that one is oh another standout watch from them but a good year i think a good year of watches i believe yeah that was the entire arrangement of watches that were featured in the show um all in all it's been a strange one to say the least we have seen quite a variety of pieces lots of lots of reissues re-releases with different colors nothing too exciting then you have some models that just drop drop the ball completely others excuse me out of the blue throwing in new models completely entirely new rearrangements um other brands introducing new movements new calibers new materials a huge year for materials i think the addition of ceramics and titaniums and we're seeing this become a thing forged carbons a lot of the time uh, all of these things in the forefront but as far as you know best watch of the year how do you even define that you know yeah it's just it's intense <clears throat> very interesting though i've enjoyed this has been the first year that we've done a watch report series where we've covered every quarter and try to capture the best releases of of the catalog at least try to i mean it's it, it's a bit more digestible being able to go in per per quarter to sum up the watches being released at the time 2021 year of the edition <laughs> uh, so the question is what's going to happen 2022 it's a really nice number so maybe they will have more anniversaries and all of that there there's there's no knowing but it's it's been a pretty interesting year for watches i mean rolex with the explorer 36 this was something that no one expected at all and subtle I'm actually noticing that a lot of these launches were pretty subtle. They weren't in your face entirely. We're seeing some great stuff from, from IWC and other manufacturers. You know, it's just, it's good. What I've loved the most, actually, to, to end this, this show on a, on a point, um, what I've loved so much is that attention is being pushed not to the Rolexes and the, the Omegas so much. There's more attention being driven to Tudors and to watches like Hermes and Longines and even Hoyer. I mean, Hoyer did some good stuff too. Um, what's another good example? Bulgari with their pieces, Doxes, uh, Microbrands, and so on and so forth. I think this is a good sign that we're seeing more attention being moved to other brands and people, especially in our like small community, are moving away from just the atypical watches that we see everywhere. I mean, it's nice that these watches exist, the Rolexes and those examples, but a lot of us <clears throat> have to wait three years to get them. And because of that, we prefer looking in areas where we can get a bit more enjoyment, have a bit more fun. <laughs> Here of the broken and upside down watch market. Yeah, should I get the should I get the hero of that right at the top? This one was the the hero of that. It definitely championed that whole edition. Um, it's been it's been good fun, a good year. I see a comment from Thomas. Thank you, Thomas. Super chat. Thank you so much. And for everyone, yeah, like he says, everyone, I hope you have a fantastic new year and Christmas. I want to carry <laughs> manhood and manhood. Thomas, thank you, really. Um, Kevin says Rolex is the best watch of the year, of course. I mean, that's over to interpretation, as as we all can say. But it's been a strange one. The, the prices, I think especially prices, we're just noticing climbing in all the fields, which is a downer. Um, but all in all, it's been a been a fun time i don't know what else i could share on this end i'm just going to be spending like 20 minutes closing all these links there's tons of them I featured a richard meal earlier that was great black ceramics and moses I, oh, I don't know what to do i'm going to stop the screen sharing now and just address you one more time in the chats but ladies and gentlemen for all of you who have joined in over the last two hours three hours it's been it's been a hell of a fun time it's been good just being able to catch up on some of the releases that have stood out the most only only covered 36, 35 watches that I try to trim down as much as possible so it was digestible for all of us. But, you know, it's been a goodie. Um, and as of going into next year, there's going to be some exciting things in the pipeline, starting with Casio. <laughs> Decided to jump down the Casio rabbit hole, and that's going to be great to review and discuss. I've got a state of the collection coming out next week. It's a short little collection review of what I have, which will be fun. Um, but for all of you who've joined in, and especially spending this time. I mean, one more week until Christmas. I really hope you spend this year with your family, that you manage to, and just have a great time. This is a time to relax, to kick back. Of course, the work doesn't stop this side. I'm still going to be back recording and editing, and, but you know what? That's the joy. Um, but for everyone out there, this is going to be the last live show of the year, I'm pretty sure. 
Yeah, because then we have Christmas, then we have you know New Year's a week after. So yeah, probably the last live show of the year, but it's been good fun. I hope you all take care. Hope you all look after yourselves. Have a superb break. Hope you put your feet up. And as mentioned, it's been a short one. Three hours, 20 minutes. That's amazing. <laughs> Thanks for that, Neff. And for all of you in the chats, I would shout you out, but it would take another half an hour for me to call out all your names. Um, you know who you are, and thank you so much for you know, being a part of the channel, supporting me, supporting what we love doing here, and that's the joy. Ladies and gents, thank you. See you in the next one. Take care of yourselves. Have an excellent new year. See you for the next live show in 2022.